we apparently are live. Is that correct, Rob? So it's just ready to start. And Francine, are you ready? We have to wait for LMC TV to say we're exactly live. Okay. Because I see something that says recording live on, on custom live streaming service, whatever that means. We're live whenever you guys are ready. Francine, you ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, I am Ralph Engel. As chair of the planning board, I have confirmed with our council, Lisa Hockman, that tonight's meeting has been convened in accordance with the governor's executive order number 202.1, as again extended, which orders to suspend certain provisions of the open meetings law in order to allow municipal boards such as this one to convene meetings via teleconferencing, or which is video teleconferencing in this case. Francine Brill, our planning board secretary, please confirm that tonight's meeting has been duly noticed and state for the record whether such notice has been posted and published. Notice has been posted and published both on the website and on the newspaper. Okay, do we also know that with respect to the public hearings that are on tonight, they've been appropriately noticed and the signs have been issued? They've been duly noticed. Okay, thank you. The public hearings open tonight will be conducted in accordance with the governor's executive order number 202.15, as again extended. The notices relating to those hearings provided instructions for members of the public on how to, to view and participate in tonight's meetings. The public has been provided with the ability to view tonight's planning board meeting on TV and online. This meeting is being broadcast live on LMC TV, which is channel 35 on Fios, assuming you have Fios that works, and channel 76 on Optimum, assuming you have Optimum that works. It is also being broadcast online live on LMC TV at lmctv.org, O-R-G. In connection with comments for the public hearings, one can call uh, in order to comment. The number to call is 1-646-876-9923. A transcript of this meeting will be available at a later date. Francine, for the record, please call the roll to record which planning board members, including alternate members, are present. Ralph Engel, Chairman. Present. Elizabeth Cooney, Vice Chair. Yes. Ira Block. Here. John Cuddy. Present. Sarah Dunn. Here. Edmund Papazian. Here. Ron Mandel. Here. Okay, so we have a quorum. In addition, those individuals who are present who are representing the town should please identify themselves with their name and their title so the viewers know who is who. Hi, um, Elizabeth Rob. Atchison. Sorry, I stepped over him. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry, uh, town engineer Rob Wasp. I was too eager. Hi, Elizabeth Atchison, environmental planner for the town of Mariner. Lisa Hockman, counsel to the planning board. Sabrina Fiddleman, town board member and liaison to the planning board. Okay. Uh, ra rather than start as we usually do with a review of the minutes of the prior meeting, uh, there's a need to go to an executive, pardon me, executive session to discuss litigation, which is ongoing and involves the planning board. So may I have a motion to open the executive session? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. So Rob. Yes, uh, at this point, I would remind all board members and staff to please mute your mics and uh, and turn off your cameras while we enter executive session. The call-in number and, and uh, 
ID code to get into the conference call was, was shared on the email that I sent the other day. So if you don't have that, please let me know. Rob, why don't you repeat it again? Please. Uh, once again, for uh, all time sorry. I no, Rob, don't read the number into the don't don't read. No, don't. no, no. I was okay. I was certainly not gonna do that. Okay. Uh, yes. If anybody needs the, the email resent, please let me know. Rob, do you mind sending it to me? It's Sabrina. Certainly, will do. Rob, send it to me too because I can't get into my emails. Rob, it's Ira. I need the uh, email again, please. Will do. Hold on, guys. Okay, anybody still in the meeting? I just hold on. Feedback issue. Um, I, I just resent the email.
Okay, welcome back. Members of the public, the board is rejoining as executive session has been completed. Thank you. Um, Rob, for the record, um, or Ralph or anyone, can I just hear um, who made and seconded the motion to leave executive session? I, I seconded the motion, Lisa. Lisa okay. Okay. And who made the motion? And I heard somebody, but I was. I'll say I'll say Ralph made the motion and Ira seconded. Fine. Okay. And do we have Francine and Liz back on the call? Yep. Uh, I'm back. I am too. I think it was Ron who made the missing Ron and we're missing Sabrina so far. Okay, I'll have Ron uh, so Francine to leave executive session, Ron made the motion and Ira seconded. Okay. Are we live again? Yes, I believe we are. Okay, let me just make it clear uh, to everybody uh, that we're not going to follow exactly the order of the agenda. And the major change in connection with that is that the application of 808 Weaver Street, Bonnie Breyer Country Club, Ronnie Breyer Country Club, in connection with a cell tower will be the last thing we will have on the agenda, not where it sits on the physical agenda at the moment. So the first item at this point is a review of the minutes of our last meeting on July 8, 2020. Ira, you said you had some comments. Yes. Um, Francine, on page one, the uh, third, fourth paragraph after call to order, uh, second line, first full beginning of the first full sentence. He state stated, I believe it should be, that the meeting is being broadcast. On page four, um, the, toward the top. Now, therefore, be it resolved. There's a stray uh, closed uh, apostrophe. Not apostrophe, quotation marks after declaration. And below uh, below that where it says the board discussed the plan um, after the date, July 7, 2020. I, I can't even make out what the letter is, but I think it's a stray letter there. M. And Tina, are you are you are you seeing this? I'm trying to see, I, I saw the negative deck, but I'm trying to see what the other one was. Below that, uh, just Oh, I see it. It's on, um, it's on the bottom of page four, Francine. Um, uh, um, two lines above the motion to close the public hearing. There's an M after 2020. Oh, I see, yes. And on page uh, five, the site plan resolution for uh, Edgewood Avenue uh, in the, listing of the plans the uh, planting plan the architect's name is Acacella, isn't it there's a stray m at the end there and and the word architect is misspelled yep. yeah, so it is a, a fittingly appropriate that you should mention that john <laughs> thank you because your daughter is one That's all I have. Does anybody else have any other corrections to make? Francine, my name on the first page has an H at the end, Sarah, on page one. Uh -huh. Got it. Thanks. Francine, on page 10, again, on the listing of drawings, architect is misspelled in the second bullet. I got it. And. Uh, I can sell it too. Let me see. I think there's one other. And on page 23, uh, up at the top where it says this decision is hereby certified and shall be, that, that was repeated twice. And finally, on 24, 
down at the bottom where it says, Mr. Engel suggested that the town may perfect its appeal. At the end of that, it should be board's attorney, apostrophe yes. Okay. Anybody else, any other comments? And may we have a motion to adopt the minutes as corrected? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay, thank you. First item on the agenda for tonight is 32 Colonial Avenue, Cooper Lane, LLC, a public hearing. May I have a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Second. We'll call the favor. Aye. 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 Okay. And and for the record, Francine confirmed earlier that this application was duly noticed. Thank you. Okay, do we have the applicant? Hold on, I have to not promote him into the meeting. Uh, 32 Colonial, that is um, Steve Marsh's team. Bear with me one moment. Okay. The African team shall be joining us right now. Hello. Welcome, Mr. Marsh. Thanks. Uh, and here comes Benny Salonitro as well. All right. Well, Salonitro. Hi. Benny, is anybody else from your team going to be joining? No, it's just the two of us. Thank you. Do, do you have anything to add to that which you told us about before? Uh, <clears throat> no, Mr. Chairman, other than we did submit revised updated plans that reflect uh, the comments that staff had made both at the meeting and prior to. So the plans that the board, is, um, the board has, and I'm uh, happy to share and, and go over, is the latest updated plans without any comments. Okay, we also have, and I don't know if you guys received a copy of a letter dated August 4th of this year from the Coastal Zone Management Commission, which has uh, resolves an issue that was in the old letter. So that's no longer an issue. Thank you. Does anybody on the board have any questions of uh, either Stephen or Benny? Any of our professional staff members have any questions of either of them? I'm going to wear the hat also tonight of our uh, consulting engineer, Anthony Alberry, who is away traveling this week on vacation. Mr. Alberry shared a memo I want to point out to the board stating that all his open engineering comments have been addressed. I'm sorry, Rob, could you say that again? Sure, I was just letting everybody know that uh, uh, Mr. Oliveri, our consulting engineer, is away on vacation this week, so I just want to speak for his comment and memo that uh, all of his open engineering comments have been addressed. Okay, great. Okay, is there any member of the public who has any comments to make in connection with this application? Okay, this is my moment when I say my piece usually. So anybody who is in the meeting from the public as an attendee, if you would like to say something at this time, please use the raise your, your hand uh, function. If you click on your uh, console, it should be one of the few options you have that will alert us that you want to make a statement. Um, I do have, I did have at least one member of the public who had pre-signed up that they wanted to speak on this matter. I believe uh, Ms. Beebe, um, if that is the case, I will unmute you now so that you can share your comments. Hello, this okay, is Kate. I have, right, go ahead. Here we go. I actually, I thought there would be more of a presentation and frankly, it's, it's very hard to do this um, toggling between the um, documents and uh, your uh, screen. Um, I, I guess this is 
uh, you know, we do have water problems down as you go towards Murray. And um, I, I will hope that, it, you know, that this addresses those down street water problems uh, for my neighbors. Uh, but other than that, I'm not really sure uh, what else I need to ask. Any um, further residents uh, information, could you please explain uh, the design basis for your on-site stormwater system? I can. I also, if, if you'd like, I can share my screen as well. That'd be helpful. <clears throat> Mrs. Beebe, can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes, I can. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this is uh, um, a plan for the proposed new house. It's uh, where the cursor is going around. This is the house. Uh, I'm just going to go up a little bit to show you the, where the existing house is. So, <clears throat> this is a property. The house has been removed, as you know. Yes. Um, so the new house will be uh, in the same uh, area in the middle of the property. There's a rear yard, there's a front yard. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Salonitro, it's very difficult to hear you. Um, I'm not really sure what the mic issue is. Uh, sorry about that, but I'm getting a lot of feedback. Whoever's not speaking should mute their microphone. Good idea. I can repeat what I started if anybody else didn't hear me. That's a lot better. So the, the uh, proposal is for a single family home to take the place of the existing home that was has since been removed. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the change is the driveway from the left is now being proposed, a driveway on the right. And <clears throat> the property uh, will have on-site uh, retention of uh, stormwater runoff from the uh, leaders and gutters of the home, the uh, proposed patio at the rear of the home and the proposed driveway will be pervious pavers. The, the um, proposal that is being presented to the, uh, to the board is that there is um, full containment of the 25 year storm event. I do recognize the concern of uh, stormwater issues uh, closer to Murray um, but this uh, property, uh, as, as the property next door was developed, this is the same uh, developer. Uh, we're both done in consideration of stormwater laws and regulations from the town. And uh, we believe that they will, you know, uh, provide for a betterment than what was there before, which was there was no uh, retention or detention systems in place. So. Uh, Ms. Beebe, I hope I answered your questions. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I am appreciative of since the uh, the uh, uh, footprint is much larger, um, so there will be more impervious area, if you will, on the lot. I was appreciative that the pavers are pervious um, for both the driveway and the patio. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Is there a dry well or some sort of, I noticed uh, five, which is next to me, there is some sort of retention system. I forget what it was called. Yes, there's two systems, one for the rear and one for in the front. So this is in the rear of the property and then there's another system being located in the front as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rob, do you have anybody else who's indicated a desire to speak as to this hearing? Uh, not quite yet. I will ask uh, one more time. Uh, are there any members of the public in the meeting in and as an attendee who wish to speak, if so, please use the raise your hand feature. Um, I also forgot to state before that we also have the town's email account, which is publicqc at townofmarinicny.org. That has been monitored, but you can also share an email there. Uh, Liz, has anybody sent in any emails uh, related to this application? Uh, no, we have uh, no emails pertaining to this application. 
I do see that uh, Miss Phoebe has raised her hand again, um, but I believe she still is able to speak. Uh, Ms. Phoebe, Rob, can you still hear us? Yes. Yes, yeah, Rob, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, this, just so you know, as a member of the public, it works vastly better, the audio, when people are reminded to mute themselves. I could not hear what you were saying, Rob. Understood. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, reminding anybody in the meeting who wishes to also send an email, so they can send an email to the public QC at townofmerinicny.org email account that is being monitored throughout this uh, meeting. So you can also share comments through email. So if nobody's okay. indicated a, a desire to speak and there are no emails that have been received, may we have a motion to close the public hearing, please? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Okay, public hearing is closed. Uh, I believe that proposed resolution has been circulated. Uh, Francine. I just played Francine, is that correct? Francine, you're muted. Yes, it's been circulated. And Francine, um, can you state for the record that all the required referrals have been made in accordance with the site residential site plan review requirements? Yes, all referrals have been made. Okay, I have a few minor modifications to make in the proposed resolution. And on page two, paragraph five, it says the applicant will arrange for a pre-construction pre meeting with the town building inspector and the town engineer prior to any site disturbance, I would put the word further before site distur disturbance because there obviously has been some because they couldn't have torn the house down without it. Uh, on the same concept, uh, two lines further, it talks about commencing site work. So I would propose to be commencing further site work. And down at the one, two, three, four, five lines at the end, it says in advance of any site disturbance, again, in advance of any further site disturbance. The other uh, proposed change I have relates to paragraph 15 of the draft, which talks about mechanical rock removal in case there is any. And I would propose that rather than what 15 now says, it read as follows. Subject to such stricter rules as to mechanical rock removal as are approved by the sound town supervisor or the town board. If there is to be mechanical rock removal, and then we just go back to the text that we have. Um, if I may interject, um, first of all, I, I think we should confine the approval to just the town board. It would not be upon the supervisor's rules. It would have to be, um, adopted by the town board. Is that correct, Rob? My understanding from the town uh, is that the, and actually from some written material that has been circulated by the sound supervisor, is that there is a temporary law in effect that the town board has not approved yet or may never approve, but is effective. And thus we have to comply and the applicant has to apply, comply with it, and uh, as well as our own resolution. So it is not a matter, the, the moratorium that existed before is no more. So the applicant can apply for a rock removal permit subject to what the, is in effect at the moment and, our, and the resolution here. So my, it's different my question, than it was a month ago. Well, why is the town supervisor involved in this the town if anything it would be the buildings department what my i asked the same question the answer i was given is that under the governor's present legal arrangements and that allow things like our meeting if they also allow temporary adoption of things of this nature by the town supervisor even though the town council has not yet approved it 
So that's my understanding from those who know more about it than I do. Well, so then I'm it just say the town supervisor in accordance with X. Yes. Da, 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 da. We have to get that. Reference. Yeah. So since I'm not familiar, since I'm not familiar with that executive order, I would add or the town supervisor to the extent um, permissible under law because my understanding is that it should be the town board, but if there's another provision of law that allows the town supervisor to make that rule, then then it, it would be as otherwise allowable under law. Why don't we just say subject to current, currently existing provisions of state and local law, comma, whatever they may be as they may change. And do that. I guess, but just wanted to make sure that the applicant and the engineer uh, are aware that the town has done something. And then and um, looking at it to make sure that you guys don't walk into a trap. Um, and um, I'm going to put that in. Um, and uh, John Cuddy had reached out to me. Um, I think it should be subject to any stricter, stricter rules. He suggested any stricter rules rather than such stricter rules. Um, as as may be approved, since we don't know, rather than shall, as may be approved. Well, but no, no, wait. Maybe approved could be anything they do anytime. It's got to be what already exists. Lisa. Yes. We're authorizing, I should put it this way. We're saying if otherwise authorized and subject to such other applicable requirements, we're imposing the following requirements. So I don't know that we have to specify who, where, what, or when. When we go to make an application, they have to comply with whatever the then applicable conditions of law are. I, I think it's appropriate to say state law and town law and county law or whatever, whatever, however you want to say it, but we're not enlarging anybody's rights. Uh, we're, we're merely saying, in addition to complying with everything else, if you can comply, you need to comply with these conditions. How about something like subject to all applicable law? Sure. We're all subject to all applicable law anyway. That works for me. Or subject to otherwise then currently applicable law. Time on. I think we should just leave it the way I just suggested it. That way it is clear we have to the applicants uh, they can take a look, see what the town has done, see what the resolution says, and I think they will figure it out for themselves without any problem. But Ralph, what I'm what I'm trying to uh, finesse here is that the conditions and the requirements today, when we pass the resolution, if we do, it be one thing, and when someone goes to pull a mechanical rock uh, permit, the conditions may change. So I think we should be clear that we're not talking about this moment when we pass this, but when someone goes to seek the required permit. I suppose they can go and get whatever permits they need right away. And uh, since they don't no. have to be start doing the work right away, and then this will not be an issue. So, sub, so uh, I could weigh in on that, Ralph, okay. just to uh, eliminate some of this confusion there. Uh, you you do need to specify the dates for the rock removal. The current law or the current um, law that is in effect by that was written as like a um, uh, interim by Nancy right uh, Seligson as the uh, executive uh, interim law is stricter than it has been in the past, and it's only getting uh, more strict, but it's not retroactive. You can't, I don't know. Um, but it's in effect right now. Currently, it's in effect. It's going to stay in effect. And it's a, it has good, uh, well-intentioned changes for the community. So why, why aren't we saying what, whatever is in effect during the period of time that the, the building permit is valid? It's two years. Well, they may, they may not have to pull the permit till they're well into construction. 
I suppose one could say the law is in effect at the time that the permit is applied. Correct, at the time that they're going to be. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the, the, just, just to you know, narrow it down a little bit, the, the construction activity at, as, as it deals with rock removal for a very limited period of time. And traditionally it's been done as a first order of business uh, in order for the house construction to take place. So we, we don't believe that the duration needs to be linked to the uh, building permit in its entirety. Uh, the rock removal will be done initially and it'll, it'll be for the maximum time that's allowed, which is currently 15, 15 consecutive days. So we're willing, we, we don't have any objection to the language. We don't think it's gonna hurt the application. Um, and we've, we've always relied on staff to guide us with the, um, with the measures that are, are, are needed. So whatever, whatever you guys want is fine because it's not going to be, uh, the rock removal operation does not extend into the building permit from beginning to end. It's, it's really just that small component in the beginning for the foundation work. After that, then it's a moot issue. It's no longer in effect. But what we're saying essentially is in addition to whatever else is applicable to get the right to remove rock, we're imposing these further conditions. They may there's be- mechanical, mechanical rock, there's rock and rock. rock removal. Understood, no, we, we get it. We've been following- I would ask, what are those further, what, uh, we yeah. haven't seen the, um, the resolution. Are you, are there additional, um, Restrictions? Well, Steve, it's everything in 15A through I, if you have the draft well, resolution. I do not have a draft resolution, but Lisa it, it is, is similar. It's very similar to, to what you saw before. Yeah, it's 15 Greystone? Yeah, it's the same. Okay, <laughs> so then it's written perfectly. I mean, there may be a word that's different, but it yeah, comes No, that was fine. I, that, that worked well. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, for 15, if there's to be mechanical rock removal subject to the following as well as any other applicable law? Fine. Anybody have a problem with that? No. Okay, may we have a motion to adopt the resolution as uh, amended or slightly re reworded, or does anybody have any other changes to make? Yeah, I, I don't have a change. I just wanted to flag um, uh, for the applicant um, and the board members two, two provisions that we just want to establish the, the basis for them. So um, one, Steve and Benny, you have seen in other resolutions, and it relates to HVAC, and it, and it just requires that um, that you demonstrate to the t satisfaction of the town engineer in consultation with the town building inspector that all proposed exterior HVAC equipment conforms with modern industry standards for sound emission and, the be and that best practices for sound mitigation have been implemented. So is, is yes, good. thank you. Okay, and then um, also there was a provision that was imposed for a 30 colonial um, uh, with respect to scheduling deliveries to avoid um, uh, impacting yeah. school traffic. We have that on the plan as well. Okay. I would just and point out that school traffic is also going to be in the middle of the day too, because if the school district is a hybrid model, the kids are going to be picked up and dropped off uh, sometime mm -hmm. in the middle of the day as well. I'm so happy to work with the building department to uh, modify those schedules to when it makes sense for uh, everybody if the schedule, if the school schedule changes. There's actually one other provision which you have not seen before. And what that relates to is some very strange language on your plans. What, the, what that language says is that without the consent of the people who did the plans, you're not allowed to use them for a building permit. So we have added a condition uh, to the draft which reads as follows. Prior to or simultaneously with applying to the town of Mamaroneck for a building permit with respect to the property, the applicant will provide the town building inspector 
with an original signed and notarized letter. That's what it refers to on the, paper, on the documents. From the manager of Andrew Nuzzy Architects LLC, confirming that he or she is the manager of the LLC and that both the seal and the signature on each page of the drawings submitted by the applicant to the town building department and reviewed on August 12, 2020 by the town planning board are originals. There is strange language uh, if you look at your plans, which is what this comes from. I've never seen that language before and you've never seen this provision before. What is the language on the plans, Ralph? Yeah, it's the language on the plans that does this. Not my plans. No, it's probably from the architect that is sending that gave us the renderings of the <clears throat> proposed house, and he's stating that those are not construction documents because he has to. Now that it has been approved, he can create construction documents, and they'll be stamped plans. But the plans that I submitted to you are are just the elevations and the floor plans, and they're not suitable for for a, a building permit that's not a construction document, but the framing plans and the roof plan to follow with my building permit application will be stamped by the architect and then, and he is the sole member and owner of the LLC. But if you want him to write an additional letter, clarify. If, if you read the condition that he put on the lower, lower I think it's left hand, depends the way you put the, the plan. Can, uh, of his all, every single page of his plan for some unknown reason, because Steve, I mean, we know what you're saying too. Uh, it's there. <laughs> I don't know why it's there. I've never seen it on any of you or anybody else's plans before. Uh, I'll take a look. And maybe what we can do, um, just because they don't, Benny and Steve really don't have time, I don't know if they've digested the language, is to just say that. Um, the applicant will provide the town building inspector, you know, or to the satisfaction of the town building inspector, um, original uh, signed and sealed plans. Is that acceptable, Ralph? Uh, if they have nothing to do with these, because these plans have this restriction built into them. All right, well then just um, yeah. make sure that Benny and Steve agree to the language. That yeah, that's fine. Okay. We got a long agenda tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody ready to go? Uh, uh, so I'll add, um, given what Sarah suggested, um, uh, as far as um, restricting the hours of delivery, should I add a clause saying that such prohibited hours to be modified in consultation with the town building inspector? Rob, uh, reasonable. Go support that. Well, why yeah. can't you just say, uh, during such hours uh, that uh, the activity would interfere with the uh, students arriving and departing from school, something like that. Okay, I can work on that. I I'll, I'll work that in. Yeah, I think in some manner to the, to the satisfaction of the building inspector, and they can talk to each other because that's pretty open of when people are gonna be coming and leaving school especially with what's going on now with none of us actually even knowing what's going on now. So can we have a motion to adopt this resolution as modified? So moved. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? You got it, guys. Build a nice house. Thank you very much. Have a nice night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is also a public hearing. In this case, in connection with 8 Hawthorne Road. Do we have an applicant as to this one? Uh, yes, we do, Ralph. I'm just in the process of uh, moving the, into the meeting panelist list, so bear with me. Sure. Okay, I have promoted uh, Ed Keating and Rick Yesep to the, our panelists. 
Uh, once you gentlemen are ready, if you could please indicate if any other members of your team are in the attendees list, they need to still be promoted in. Um, this, um, this is Rick Yestat, the architect, and we have the, uh, the owner present, and also, I believe, Mike, uh, Michael Stein uh, is present also. Is that true, uh, Rob? And that's uh, the evidence thereof at the moment. I've just moved Stein into our panelist and is doing now. I, I couldn't understand what you said, Rob. All right, I must be having microphone issues. I just I just stated that I just moved Mike Stein into our panelist group, so he should be joining us uh, momentarily. Okay, thank you. I, I see him, but I, I don't hear him. He's uh, muted. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm just I'm not sure what just happened. I got bumped out, so I don't know if there was a question. Oh, no, just, I'm just sure getting, you're sorry. We're just getting started, Michael. Okay. Okay, let me point out that my understanding is that the front porch, which is what would have required a zoning variance, is no more. So that the what is now being proposed is totally zoning compliant. And so we could proceed tonight. That is uh, Rick, any, you, do you disagree with that? No, that is correct. Um, are you available to screen share with the latest version of the plans or Michael? Yes. Why don't we first open the public hearing and go from there? So uh, I have a motion to open the public hearing, please. So moved. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And for the record, Francine confirmed earlier this was duly noticed. Thank you. OK, uh, is there anything new to present other than the change that I just mentioned as to the front porch? Uh, no, there is not. OK, does anybody, any member of the board uh, or any member of, the, of our professional staff have any questions, comments in connection with any of this? I would just ask the applicant team that for any members of, of the public that might be viewing this meeting, if you guys could just uh, go through a brief presentation of what's being proposed. Okay, why don't we do that? Rick, can you do that? Or yeah. Michael or somebody? Yeah, let me bring up the, uh, the current uh, drawings. Okay, so uh, this is the, uh, the current drawings uh, without the porch, uh, zoning compliant uh, application. <clears throat> the, uh, the site plan has been modified accordingly. Uh, that uh, brings everything uh, into zoning compliance. So the, um, this is the, uh, the proposed site plan the change is that the porch in the front has been removed and the existing uh, vestibule that uh, was previously approved for front yard variants remains. The plans have been modified to reflect that as well. The first floor, the porch has been removed. and subsequently from all the other plans, including the roof plan. Elevations you see here in the side, porch is removed and the existing vestibule remains. Uh, next sheet, the front porch 
in this location has been removed. The existing vestibule remains. And in addition, the planting plan also has been revised. So the porch has been removed on that drawing as well. Are there any questions? Any questions from anybody on the board and or anybody in our professional staff? Um, no further questions from engineering. I will share that uh, Anthony's memo has indicated that all of his technical engineering comments have been addressed. Uh, we do have an open note that the survey that was previously submitted was not signed in TL. However, we trust mm -hmm. that was a technical oversight and uh, should not hold up with approval this evening. Okay. Uh, can you find out if there is any member of the public who would like to comment, question, etc.? Certainly. Uh, for any members of the public who may be viewing this meeting uh, through Zoom, if you wish to speak at this point, um, please use the raise your hand feature as that will alert us to your desire to speak. Uh, you can also submit comments to the town's email account, publicqc at townofmerinecny.org, which should be shown on the screen at this time. Uh, Liz, has anybody sent in any, any emails regarding this application? Just checking now. Uh, I don't see any right now. Okay, and uh, nobody has has used the raise your hand feature within our call. Uh, Francine, can you please confirm that all required referrals were made? Yes, all required referrals were made. Okay. May we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Public hearing is closed. Again, let's go to the draft uh, resolution. I did have one item uh, I wanted to clarify with the applicant team regarding the resolution. Uh, the document in its current form attaches several of the board's standard conditions related to mechanical rock removal. Uh, it's my understanding that no rock removal is anticipated with this application, but I wanted you guys to confirm that, please. Uh, could you repeat that last part, Rob? Sure. Uh, I was just asking the, the applicant team to confirm whether or not any mechanical rock removal is contemplated as part of this project? No, it is not. Okay, uh, based upon that then, the draft um, condition number 15 from this resolution uh, can be eliminated with all of its uh, subconditions. Well, let me, let me say there are two ways to deal with that. One is the one you just said, Rob, and the other, that precludes a change in plans as they build in case they were to decide that they do want mechanical rock removal. If we leave it with the language that uh, Lisa has now uh, worked up, if they never use it, they never use it. There's no, I don't see the downside to leaving it there because it gives more options in case somebody runs into trouble, which every now and then happens when somebody's trying to build something. But we would need to give the applicant an opportunity to hear what these conditions are because un unlike with the prior application, I don't think they're familiar with these conditions. Let me ask a question. I mean, we have the applicants here as well as a representative. Uh, we can go through it just in case you need it at some point, uh, or we can just skip it because you don't need it. And then we would eliminate it from the resolution. Uh, which would you prefer? I mean, fair, fair point, Ralph. You don't know when, uh, when you'll need such things. You know, the, the, our backyard is, is more swamp uh, than rock. So I, I highly, highly doubt that we'll need it. Um, but in, you know, it's, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. No one, no one has ever predicted this kind of stuff. Uh, if it makes sense to have language in there, I, to your point, I may have been asking the board and, and, and Rick, um, is there downside of providing such language or including such language in, in the resolution? Uh, if we don't use it, if we don't have to dig, that's fantastic. 
Uh, if we do need so, does that make that process easier if we have to come back and request uh, a permit for that 15 day process of removing rock? Mechanically, that is. I, I think the issue is this, is that um, these conditions, I believe, are um, stricter than, maybe stricter than the current law to the benefit of neighbors. And so I think what board members would conclude is that in the event there is rock removal, they would want these conditions to attach. Um, and if there is not rock removal, the board members may or may not wish to impose a condition that there be no mechanical rock removal. So if the condition, if, if paragraph 15 with these conditions is simply eliminated, um, there's nothing in the resolution that prevents you from getting a rock removal permit unless the planning board wants to attach that as a condition. Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, Lisa just said, then you gotta come back. Correct. Right. If we leave it where it is, you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, th that sounds good by me. I, I highly doubt that we would need to remove rock uh, given the uh, my understanding of the you know, the makeup of our backyard. Um, so if we remove the language, I, I think that's fine by us. If we have to come back, then then so be it. You have to Does come. That make sense by you, Rick. Yeah, if, agree. If you have to come back, it's an amended site plan application. You go through the whole rigmarole. Whereas if we put the language in and say, in, in effect, in the event applicant requires to engage in mechanical rock removal, such rock removal in addition to other requirements of law shall comply with the following. I think if, I'm, if I may just suggest um, to the applicant, um, these conditions which we can summarize for you or read to you, whatever you prefer, um, are, are basically have been agreed to by other applicants and their professional staff as reasonable in connection with mechanical rock removal. So, um, they they relate and Rob Wasp can, can summarize or describe them to you or maybe even email them to you or whatever is easiest and then it might you know make sense for you to just leave them and they would only apply if you apply for a rock removal permit. Yeah, I mean, I don't see there's a downside to this. If you don't have to use it, you don't use it. Yeah. So, okay. uh, Ralph, your original point and Lisa, thank you for the clarification. Um, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable to us. Put them in there if we use them unfortunate uh, but it's uh, better to get it in there now and so just to give you i i would say and rob please correct me if this is wrong that the most onerous requirement imposed relates to providing a you know um uh conducting a survey for neighboring properties um so that they can be protected in case there's any da damage to their um you know to their house during rock removal um, Rob, is there anything else you think we should call out that deviates from the current law? Yeah, I was just, I was just going to summarize that essentially what the conditions call for is that you are required to offer to any neighboring property a preconditioned survey of their house prior to starting any sort of rock hammering by a qualified um, a qualified firm that is uh, you know set in, in that line of work. So those reports would have to be submitted to the town prior to the permit being issued. And then you'd be required to retain that said firm to monitor the actual rock hammering work to you know to make sure that um, all all the mitigation of vibration is being followed, as well as following best practices for dust management and for um, site cleanliness throughout the duration of, of the uh, of the project. The general concept is what you would want if your neighbor were doing a yeah, mechanical. That sounds, that sounds fair by us. Okay, so let's leave it in though with the language changes that we did on the last one, which are yeah. more protective of, of you two, and uh, make it clear what law applies, and then we can leave the document the way it is and finish this tonight, I think. Okay. Okay. So, uh, may I have a motion to, did we actually, we haven't closed, did we close the hearing? Did I forget that? I believe we did. Okay, good. Sorry. Uh, Francine will let us know if we did not. It's closed. Fine. 
So a motion then please to adopt the resolution draft that we have seen with the modifications, which really are the same ones that were made on the prior application. Again, so for moved. provisions that uh, may never be used. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye, please. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Have a good time. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you to the board. Thank you. Rob, the town has to give you a new microphone. You are echoing unless it's just me. Yeah, Rob. Okay. Uh, since we have one more public hearing, let's get that done which is the Espresso Cafeto, 1262 Boston Post Road. This is the, a public hearing for renewal of a special use permit. The application indicates that nothing is any different than it was before. But I think we should let the applicant speak. Thanks everybody. I am uh, making one quick change to the um, analyst list here to let the applicant join. I had not originally noticed that we had both a Valentina Soto and a Valentino on the call. So I mistakenly promoted the wrong person. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Hi. What you are doing is requesting a renewal of the exact same special use permit you had before. Is that correct? Exactly the same. Nothing has changed. Well. Okay. For the knowledge of the people on the call, in connection with a different application made in connection with the same shopping center, there were some conditions regarding the uh, ramp to and from the parking lot. Right. Those conditions have not yet been met by the landlord. They're not that our applicant could do anything about it one way or the other. And uh, the applicant, if I understand correctly, Rob, just don't tell me if I'm wrong, has agreed that the, those will be complied with as to the property itself by the end of next week. And as to the one part that requires New York State Department of Transportation approval, as soon as that approval is formally obtained, but it's already been informally obtained. Is that all true? As far as I understand it is, yes. Yes, Ralph, um, that is correct. The town engineering department is working directly with the uh, shopping center's engineer, and it is our understanding that that work for the on-site improvements will be completed within the next week. And we expect to receive documentation of the state permit for the no left turn sign uh, shortly as well. Okay, so it would seem to me that none of this should affect the application before us. Sure. So does anybody on the board or professional staff have any questions of the applicant? Does anybody in the, the, from, uh, the public the have any questions? Sorry, sorry, sorry right, go ahead, Rob. I was, I was just sharing for the board's information that from a code enforcement and building department perspective that there are no open violations associated with the applicant's use. Thank you. It's, do you want, uh, Rob and Liz, would you find out please if any member of the public has sent us anything or wants to join uh, the hearing? Uh, there are no emails in the account. I forgot to make my statement. Um, any members of the public who may be viewing this meeting as a Zoom attendee, please use the raise your hand function now if you wish to be heard. Um, as Liz just stated, you can also send emails to the public QC at townofamerinicny.com email account. I'm not seeing anybody with a raised hand up. So I have, Ralph, I have a question for the applicant. Sure. Ed. Uh, Notwithstanding what you just said, are you comfortable with the hours that are in your special permit? That's seven to five Monday through Friday and seven to four on Saturday and Sunday. 
Do you want that expanded or is that fine? Um, it's I, I, as of now, it's fine. Uh, the weekend we could expand for one hour, but um, in the morning seven, it's the right time for us to start. In the evening or afternoon? If we could expand the weekend to five, I think that would work on our favor. Does anybody on the board have a problem with making the change, that change? No. The only uh, caution I will just point out is that I know, know that the applicant's use was zoned as I believe luncheon and if I'm not mistaken. So I was just, just ask we have to make sure that the um, that, that use definition does not preclude that, that, that extra hour as much. Uh, I'm sorry, I you got uh, this broken up, Rob, and I couldn't understand. What Mr. Wasp is saying is that when we received the initial special permit, there was some dis discussion about what the nature of the business was under the zoning code, and we it was concluded that you were a luncheonette. Uh, and he's saying we have to determine if you want to operate an hour longer, whether that's allowed for a luncheonette. All right, so I have the definition up and there is, it just says um, that it's an establishment offering ready to consume and made to order food, prepared on the premises, served at a sit down counter and or limited table service. Um, the menu is usually limited to breakfast and or lunch and a limited assortment of sundries may be offered for sale. There's nothing about time. Um, I, there's something about 19 seats that's somewhere else. I just have to. That's, that's in the existing resolution too. We'll just continue with that. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any um, conflict with the time. And okay. We permit till five o'clock on every day, but the weekends. So. That's correct. I see yeah, nothing I... wrong with expanding. No. No, there's no problem. I just did a global search for luncheonette and there's nothing that restricts the time, except if you're getting close to midnight, then it could be an issue. Thank you, Lisa. Just want to make sure. Okay, so everybody has seen hopefully a draft resolution which would be changed uh, for the when the time change that was just discussed, otherwise be exactly the same as it was. Does anybody have any further changes to make to it? Well, I guess for the expiration date, should we do um, two years from the expiration date of the prior? Isn't that what we usually do? Yeah, so that would be more March 14th, 2022. You know, uh, I, he I hesitate to be accused of taking a different position, uh, but I think I'm the one who advocated for a continuity of special permits, and I've been persuaded that it makes no sense except to give us more work. So uh, I don't see why it couldn't be the maximum period from the time it's issued. Okay, let's get a view. Would people prefer two years unless from the expiration of the prior permit or two years from tonight? Unless there's a specific uh, circumstance where we perceive that somebody has been gaming the system by operating without the permit or dragging their feet and applying for a new one. Yeah, I disagree no. with that, Ira. I think we have to be consistent. You can't be subjective and that's what you're taking into consideration. Um, I think it has to go for two years from the date it expires. It's certainly much simpler that way in terms of consistency and precedent. Yeah, I would apologize to the applicant, but I agree with Edmund. I'll go back to my original position then. <laughs> okay, so we're going to be two years from the expiration of your prior special permit. All right. Well, may we have a motion to close the public hearing, which in this case I don't think occurred. We never so, opened. Oh, you got to open it too. Sorry, going too quickly here. Uh, okay, but motion to open the public hearing. So move. Second. Aye. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion to close the same public hearing, please. 
So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, motion to adopt the resolution as presented to us with the exception of the one hour change at the end of the day and on what's it, the weekends, right? Yes. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Bye. <laughs> okay. Next item, going back somewhat to the agenda order, is the 2500 Boston Post Road. As to that, my belief is that the app, neither the applicant nor the applicant's attorney is actually on the Zoom call. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Ralph. Okay, but we did get a request from the applicant's attorney, Mr. Mason, due to the fact that his wife is seriously ill, that he'd be excused from attending tonight. Uh, but he requested that we approve the setting of a public hearing on the renewal of the special use permit, not on anything else, uh, for our September meeting. Does anybody uh, have any comments with respect to that? Mr. Chairman, um, I previously suggested uh, that I thought you believed that the application was not complete. The application that is not complete was the application for an amended site plan. That is not what he's asking for a public hearing on. He's basically withdrawn that to the extent he ever made it. I mean, the only thing he really submitted in connection with it was a site plan called existing site plan, which of course was not and is not the existing site plan. So there's no request for doing anything in connection with the amended site plan. It's simply a matter of a request for an extension of the now already expired prior special use permit. Lisa, am I wrong? No, I don't have a problem with that. And that's correct. That's um, the application before the board is extension of the now expired special use permit. Okay, may we have, may I have a motion please to uh, set the public hearing for a September meeting? So move. Second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye, please. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? I'm abstaining. Okay, one abstention. And uh, uh, who will advise Mr. Mason since he's not here? And I just need to, for the record, Ira, can you please um, give a reason for your abstention? I do not believe I'm in possession of sufficient information to make an informed determination. This is a, to me, a very confusing circumstance and I am concerned uh, we didn't get to explore this in, uh, uh, when we considered the issue, uh, that the record is fuzzier than I think it should be with respect to what I understand the legal issues may be. We will, however, have a public hearing at which the applicant hopefully will appear in person by council or something. And uh, please, Lisa, if you speak to Mr. Mason, tell him that somebody should appear and we don't want an adjournment of that because it's been going on forever. And at that point, are you free to ask any questions you want to? So at this point, I think we can move on to the next. Uh, is it Lisa, will you be speaking to Don Mason and letting him know what's going on so that they notice it properly, hopefully put up signs timely and things of that sort? Uh, sure, I'll give him a call. Okay. And, and I respectfully suggest, uh, since there's a potential for further proceedings beyond the planning board that uh, 
he sent us a written request or he sent Rob a written request as our agent that certainly you can call, but that we make a formal response also. Yes. Yeah, I think you should also make clear to him that we do not intend to adjourn this if they screw up on notice, so the posting of signs, et cetera. And at that point, we will most certainly request of the building department that they do their job uh, for what happens when somebody's operating without a current special use permit when they need one. Okay. Next item is the Westchester Design Center, 2444 Boston Post Road. Okay, I am moving the applicant's representative into our panelist group. Remind the applicant group to please unmute your microphone and camera as we've now added you to the call. If there are any other members from your team who are still in the attendees group, can you please use the raise your hand feature? At this point, we seem to have no active applicant. I see um, one more person has raised their hand, so I'm going to promote them. Uh, Mr. Kent Covington. Uh, Kent, are you there? I see you're now in the panelist group. Hello. I can hear somebody. Is that an Emory? Hello. Yes. Can you? Uh, not very well at the moment. Is this uh, Valentino? I believe you're the applicant. Yes. Yes, this is Valentino. Okay, that's better now. Good evening. How are you doing? Okay, can you right. give us a summary of uh, what it is you desire to do and where you intend to do it? Uh, what we intend to do is um, uh, to create a showroom uh, with um, a retail showroom for uh, tile, um, kitchen cabinets, uh, wood flooring, and uh, doors, special doors, luxurious doors. And this will be located where? 2444 uh, Boston Post Road. In the in, site? Uh, in uh, And this is at the site that was formerly used by CVS, is that correct? Correct. Is the applicant team able to screen share um, their drawing for the board to view, um, showing their, their store layout? What do you? Oh. That's going on, Rob. Do we have any rules with respect to signage for new uses? Um, any sort of new signage would be subject to the zoning code. Um, I'm not familiar with what the restrictions are for a primary building mounted sign, but I would defer to the building uh, the building inspector on those matters. Okay, because I believe, I'm not certain of this either, that signage has to be dealt with uh, by Board of Architectural Review on commercial 
sites, for example, what we went through a while ago uh, with the uh, warehouse on Fifth Avenue. Oh, well, I just thought it's something they, they, they might be able to do at the same time. Well, they had the application and they plan on sending it in shortly to the BAR. Thank you very much. Okay. You're ahead of us. That's good. Mr. Chairman, uh, apart from that, at least in the package that I received, it appears to be uh, deficient and incomplete in several respects. Uh, I have two pages of a lease. One is the first page of a, what's said to be a draft that's undated, and the second page is a signature page that's not executed. Presumably there are other provisions of a draft lease that we don't have, let alone an executed draft, and I don't have a copy of a deed from the owner of the property. I don't know if my package was deficient or the packages plural are deficient. I think it may be that the packages are deficient. Because I'm looking through mine and I don't see the same things you don't see. Also, I noted in recent discussion uh, something that was circulated about a case uh, in a court in our area, which basically said that uh, if there is no clear lease in place or other or equivalent, the applicant has no right to apply for in the first place. So we would have to have at least a lease. And the environmental assessment form appears to be incomplete as well. Uh, well, for that, um, as long as we can confirm this is type two, they actually, if it's type two, and, I, and Liz will um, confirm whether it is, uh, that means no environmental review is necessary. So we have some things we don't need and don't have other things we do need. So, and Liz, um, Liz, please tell me uh, if, if you're able to determine at this point whether it's type two. I'll take a, I'll take a look at the list while you guys are talking. Yeah, I, this does have to go to Coastal Zone anyway. Does it not, Liz? Yeah, it, it should go to Coastal Zone. Usually um, special permit uh, applications go to Coastal Zone. Um, so this one would have to. And uh, the meeting will be on uh, Tuesday, August 18th. So uh, do they have time to get their papers to you if you don't have them? Yeah, because uh, everybody's in the same boat. We have our meeting was pushed a little earlier because uh, people are away usually the end of August. So um, in order to accommodate them, we're going to have a meeting on the 18th. But they, they you know, if they, they don't want to come that early, they can come in uh but it's the end of September. Then it would be after our meeting, so. Right. Uh, we'll delay matters some, but on the other hand, the things that I will raise have to be resolved before we can proceed anyway. Valentino there? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you hear that um, comment as far as the coastal zone meeting is concerned? And are you able to make that earlier meeting? If you can't make the earlier meeting to coastal zone, this is going to get pushed back. Yes. Yes, we you will can try make to make that meeting for August 18th. Liz, what does he have to submit to you? Um, he'll just need uh, one PDF of the application and uh, one hard copy, and then I have a really brief coastal assessment for him. But uh, if you can, um, we can maybe we can talk tomorrow. That would be uh, helpful, so I can so guide you better. But as Ira pointed out, uh, and as we've now seen actually a court case about. We have to have a signed lease. We need to know that the landlord owns the property, which is a deed to the landlord, copy of the deed to the landlord, which he submitted not that long ago in connection with Staples. And it was submitted, right? Okay, Staples, it was uh, uh, and, and you know, same shopping center. And we need to, for there to be a signed lease, not a draft of a lease, and we need to have it all. The 
full list? A full list. Okay. Um, and if the lease is to, if you can, um, if you want to send it electronically, you can you can send that, or you know, if if it's a very lengthy lease, then just contact the building department, and we'll tell you the page that we need, the pages that we need to see. Do you have a signed lease, Mr. Lopricolo? Okay. Yes, they do. Good. Uh, um, Lisa, I just looked at the type two action list, um, and I believe that this is a uh, type two action. So you're saying no environmental form is required? Yes. But a visit to the coastal zone meeting is required and the submission that was mentioned before is required. Right. Okay, in order, you know, since in the real world, everything is sort of screwed up given what's going on with the pandemic, et cetera, for timing and everything else. And we have somebody who's trying to open a business. I'm wondering what members of the board would think of the concept of setting a public hearing for September subject to our receipt at least 14 days in advance of what's missing, which is primarily, if not totally, Elise. I'm good with that. I don't have a problem with that. Neither I think we all. should do that. Okay. We have a motion to set a public hearing on this application uh, for September, subject to receipt of everything that's missing more than 14 days before our meeting. Valentino, the, um, if you have any questions about what to submit, should he contact Lisa? Rob or Lisa? Lisa or Francine? Yeah, okay. I think, yeah, I think it's actually best that the um, that the building department be the gatekeepers for the material, and then Rob or Francine, please feel free to reach out to me if either of you have any questions. Yes. I agree with that. Yes, uh, Valentino, I believe we've exchanged emails. So uh, please, you know, feel free to forward any questions or documents to my attention along with Francine, and we will direct them appropriately. Okay, does anybody have anything further for this evening on this application, or are we ready to go for the next one? Okay, next. Uh, I Sorry. Yeah, a draft resolution for uh, uh, the public hearing in September. Uh, yes, with the, um, Lisa, would you be able to prepare one? Yes, and that's that request is customary, so I'm happy to prepare a draft resolution. Thank you. You, you understand, Mr. Lopergolo, if we've scheduled the public hearing, besides the documents you need to submit 10 days in advance, you need to send notice out we would be sending all the documents, uh, you know, as soon as we can. It's 14 days, please. So and the notice will all have to be done on time. Check with uh, Francine as to what the rules are. Absolutely. I think that uh, we try to provide all the documents in a record time. And uh, Francine can tell you we have been very much, um, you know, um, involved on um, getting our documents ready, but it seems like there is still something missing and we will provide uh, with that. But you also will need to send out notice for the public hearing to be held, even if you satisfy the document requirements. Okay. And publish a sign on the side of, of uh, an appropriate exact worded sign at the store itself. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we're talking about the lease and we're talking about proof that the landlord is in fact the landlord. Basically, okay. the landlord, which if I remember correctly from the last one, changed its name sometimes. So that there was a, that the documents were a little more complex than typical. Okay. Um, yeah, yes, Mr. Kent uh, Covington is, uh, I think is uh, also uh, the agent of uh, the landlord. So um, he's uh, in the meeting right now. So uh, he's uh, listening to our conversation. Fine. Okay, I think it's time to move on to the next application. Which Did is we vote for a public meeting or we don't have to? 
do we actually have to have a vote, Lisa? I think we don't. You, you are not required to vote and your past practice has been to vote, but you are not required to vote. Okay, so but to stick with past practices, Ed points out, let's have a motion to set a public hearing subject to receipt of the missing information in time and the public hearing would be set for our September meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Public hearing is set. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item is an app a new application also from regarding 5 Cornell Street. The address is actually in Scarsdale, but the property uh, being worked on is in the town of Maryland. Okay, I am now promoting the applicant's team into our meeting. Uh, as you join, please let us know if anybody from your team is missing. Welcome. Do you have uh, any architect, engineer, lawyer, or somebody representing him? Yeah, Elliot should be uh, on the line. Elliot Senior. I see uh, Ellie and the Amadores here. I'm going to promote him in. And I see Elliot as well. Okay, very good. Yeah, Elon is our builder and Elliot's our civil engineer. And uh, Jordan is our architect. They should all be logged in. And Dan, I'm sorry, Dan Sherman is our landscape architect. Okay. If Greg Cacciapoli is there, he's my assistant. And Jordan. Jordan is who? Oh, Jordan sorry. Jordan is our architect. architect. Okay. I'm sorry. I missed that. Hmm. So this is an initial presentation for consideration. Who's going to present? Uh, I guess that would be me, Elliot Senor, to start with. So if you, um, if I can share the screen, that would be uh, share. And I think you could make it just so you could hear. All right. Um, uh, can you see that screen? Yes. Yeah, and then I'll let you know if I'm on, if I'm live. Note that we're getting some feedback. So anybody who's not speaking right now, if you please mute your microphone. All right. So uh, this is a property um, at three Cornell, at five Cornell. Uh, it currently has a ha uh, had a house on the property. It's uh, being in the process of uh, demolished. Uh, it's a it's a, a an acre over an acre of property. Um, we're currently proposing to build a tennis court, um, a pool, and a residence here. The residence has a circular driveway coming into the side. Uh, the property right now slopes uh, significantly from front to back. Uh, we're going to build a, uh, a series of terraced walls, um, five feet in height each, or the first one is five feet. The second one varies from zero uh, to five feet. I think at this point it's five feet. Over here it's uh, about 18 inches uh, and they wrap around the side. Uh, we currently have some existing plantings on the neighboring property. Uh, the wall, the proposed wall is about um, five feet off of the property line. Um, we have uh, prepared, uh, uh, we've done some, some exploratory testing for uh, drainage in terms of um, test pits and perk, and perk tests. Uh, we're showing some drainage here for uh, the house, that the, the residence, the pool. And then we show some area around um, a channel drain around the tennis court uh, to, take, uh, to take that water. Uh, we did a cross section of the walls. So this is what the walls look like. No, 
also on the north on this side the north side of the of the tennis court is also a wall so we have um, two walls here and then we did a uh, wall here to bring it up to the uh, pool area uh, level backyard or sloping about four or five percent from the pool to the backyard um, this is uh, so I have a rendering of the uh, of the front of the house this is what the front of the house looks like uh, and we've done a series of renderings uh, of the back of the house uh, streetscape this is the existing house at seven um, Cornell uh, this is the five Cornell and three Cornell uh, is vacant. Um, the three Cornell house is being, has been submitted to Scarsdale for a building permit um, for that property. That property, um, the town line goes through the, uh, through the property. I think I have the town line here. Uh, this is the town line that runs here. I could draw a line on that. Uh, no, I guess I can't draw a line. Draw a line, yes. Uh, that's the town line. Um, so the other house that's being built on three Cornell is in the town of Scarsdale and being submitted to the town of Scarsdale um, for building review. That also went to uh, Architectural Review Board in Scarsdale. Um, all right, we have some views, some renderings of the... Uh, property from the back. Uh, this is the tennis court. The, the terraced walls are going to be planted uh, with shrubs. Um, like I said, they're terraced. Uh, we also have this wall around the tennis court. Um, there's in a little area there for observation of the game or, you know, your water jug or what have you. Um, this is the uh, wall without the shrubbery in, in front of it. Um, so that you can see what the wall looks like. The, the neighboring property has a row of arborites. This was all one big piece of property, the two, three, and five that was split off. Um, I think uh, five Cornell is about 30,000 square feet, and I think this is over an acre and a half. Um, just some additional renderings that we've done um, from the different views of the backyard. Um, from ground level, the, the uh, Golf course driving range is the adjacent to the to the rear of the property. Um, so that's what the uh, what the renderings are. Um, the as far as the uh, engineering is concerned, um, like I said, uh, uh, we are sloping the backyard about um, four or five percent to create a yard for the for the house, um, and uh, we've. We've submitted, uh, I think, everything on the checklist. We've submitted uh, for the drainage here, um, cross sections. We had two meetings with the uh, peer review and went over uh, many of the items, uh, um, have submitted any of the items that came up during that peer review. Um, I'm not sure if Dan uh, Sherman wants to say anything about the uh, planting and the landscaping. Dan, you got to unmute your you're uh there you go so elliot can you remind me how many trees are being removed in this plan i think it's it was it uh, what was the number of removals because i have the replacements shown but i wasn't so sure what the this final. is the so this is the drawing of the existing condition so the existing conditions already has a pool has the house and has the driveway here so we're taking out one two three four five uh six seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, about a dozen trees or so uh, from the existing. I believe I, there's something from uh, Mr. Amador uh, that shows 28 trees being removed. That's, that's the number that I remember was 28. Right. Um, yeah, it, that, it was a, a dozen plus these trees here, I think. Right. Since that was counted, we decided we're going to be able to keep the large oak tree. So there's 27, there's a really beautiful oak tree just on the east side, I can point here with my cursor. We're keeping that. Uh, so we're, yeah. we're replacing, where I'm adding 39 trees without counting all the arborvitaes, which just add up to a lot of hedging. So I have 39 trees and I've selected them all from the replacement list. There's hawthorns and Eastern red cedar, pin oaks and sugar maple, uh, dogwoods. They're from the replacement tree list. Um, 
rest of its standard landscape, but I I see any there are some pretty spectacular trees in the front of this property, left and right sides, side. Uh, they are staying there on the, in the Scottsdale part, but uh, there's a, a huge, to put a mildly tree on the right facing the house and some other shrubbery of hmm. considerable size on the left side. Uh, uh, I see no changes on your plan. Are they all staying where they are? No, um, the new plan has the driveway and the garage in those locations. So the big pin, the big oak tree is staying, but the weeping beech and the weeping hemlock are going. Do you have a, Dan, do you have a landscape plan you could share? I don't, I don't have that up. Mm -hmm. Looking at it, but I don't know how to show it, how to share it. Well, if I, you, know, you can't really see this. I, I, no, but, but if you go to the bottom of the screen, oh, you don't have a, do you have a digital? You know what? May I interrupt? This is Jordan Rosenberg, the architect. I can share the landscape plan and Dan can talk. Okay. Oh, good. Because I'm not team viewered into my office files right now, so I wouldn't be able to access it. Actually, I will, let me just raise one thing because this relates to landscape, but probably not in your landscape plan. The application that we're going to be discussing after yours can potentially affect how you may want to landscape some of this. So you may want to pay some attention to it or uh, uh, at least keep tabs on what's going on. So, you can see so if you can hear me, this is the, on this east side is the large pin oak that's staying. I mean, it's a red oak, it's huge, it's beautiful. And um, the other bigger trees on the property just don't fit into the plan. So we're adding new pin oaks and a new sugar maple. There's a tennis court, there's a row of crab apples. There's some hawthorns around the uh, tennis court. We've used Eastern red cedars as most of our upper level planting trees. And we're transplanting the two beautiful magnolias that are presently at the south side, the back end near the golf course to the front. They're hidden by people's pictures right now. But in the loop of the driveway, we're going to put the two magnolias. And we're keeping the Douglas fir. Have you seen the August 6th memo from our consulting engineer with a bunch of issues? I have not. Um, I have not seen that either. Rob, can you arrange to send that to them? Certainly. I will forward that to the applicant's team. Um, just to go over a brief summary of Anthony's office's comments. It was asked that a zoning compliance table needs to be added onto the plan. Uh, it's pointed out that it, the project can call for a significant amount of fill to be imported, uh, roughly quantity of 5,700 cubic yards. Uh, so we'll be requesting some notes regarding that the material being to be run it must be clean and meeting up certain standards. Um, water and sewer services must be approved by the village of Scarsdale. And it was asked as to clarify the method for pool drainage slash drawdown upon winterization. All right. Um, all right. Yeah, we uh, we certainly can uh, talk to Scarsdale about the sewer and water services. Uh, the drawdown, it's uh, going to be a uh, cartridge filter, so there's no um, backwash or something like that. And uh, as far as uh, a drawdown, if for any reason there has to be a drawdown, it'll be pumped to, uh, uh, to a, a truck to truck away. We don't have any street drains there uh, and we can't pump it onto the golf course uh, property. So the only place for us to, to pump or uh, to draw down any significant amount would be to uh, uh, cart it away. Okay. Uh, Rob, you are aware that Anthony has 11 items on his memo. Oh, perhaps I, yes, I did not scroll to page two. Um, oh. Perhaps rather than go through yeah, point I by was, point, I, that was, uh, I will I share that was great. Time. It was only five items. It was wonderful. <laughs> Francine, did you get that demo? Was that in the package? Oh, no, I believe that was in the email. 
Did you say you emailed it, Rob? I believe Anthony's memos were submitted via email, so I believe they were forwarded to the board on Friday. I'll have to check with uh, Francine to see if that was true. If not, we will, we will, we will share it after this meeting tonight. Um, generally, the engineering items with uh, Anthony, we have always uh, um, met his requirements, so I don't think that it should, anything there is probably uh, that, that much of a problem. It doesn't appear to me that there's anything that would be a significant problem. A lot of details. Do you feel like this application is developed enough to come to Coastal Zone Management Commission next week on Tuesday evening? Um, we certainly do. Yeah, I think so. I, it's nothing I would change without reviewing any other specific comments. Uh, one thing to um, uh, establish is that this will be a type one action for seeker purposes. And so um, that requires a long form environmental assessment, as well as um, if uh, what's considered an, a coordinated environmental review. And so to the extent there are any other agencies um, that have discretionary approval, um, I would recommend the Mamaroneck Planning Board to be the lead agency and um, the planning board would have to issue a notice of intent to act as lead agency. Um, and then uh, other agencies would have 30 days to contest that. And then we did submit a long EA form with our, with our paperwork. Okay, so what, what we would need to know is any, any other agencies with jurisdiction to, um, to approve this. Um. Well, let's look at the form. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned Scarsdale. Scarsdale, yes, um, and 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 it's uh, you know within so many feet of the boundary line, so they have to be noticed uh, as well on any uh, anything that we do. Um, and then there's, uh, I guess, uh, planning board, uh, you guys, and coastal zone. I'm just trying to scroll back to to the through the. EAF that we submitted to see where our, our list is, um, but uh, was submitted. The list was submitted, uh, and um, if we left something off, what well, we, we said was, uh, um, no. All right, uh, there's no county, regional, or state agencies or federal agencies required. There is the town. Uh, 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 there's no zoning board requirements. Uh, uh, just a just the town, just the planning board, as far as we're concerned. And what, which um, agency? Which, is it the Scarsdale Planning Board that has? Um, no, I mean it would just be uh, notice to the notice to the to them as a municipality adjacent to the property. They don't have any jurisdiction over this. Uh, we when we did the subdivision of this property off of the neighboring property, uh, we came to both towns. Um, and because the property on a neighboring property or the subdivision lot was all in Scarsdale, uh, we, uh, you had recommended or gave up the rights to them as being uh, the board to go to. Okay. Uh, now that we're in the Mamaroneck side of the property, we're coming to you for, for, uh, for your approval of the site plan because you have site plan approvals. All right. Well, so it sounds like there may be no other agencies with discretionary approval and coastal zone is just advisory. So there may uh, be no coordinated so, review necessary. Yeah. So I was, I was just going to point out just to clarify Elliot's statement that um, you know, it would be the Scarsdale Department of Public Works that issues the permits for the water and sewer connection. Or it might be the water department for the water, I suppose. Um, the project also requires a DC speedies permit, which is a general permit. Uh, the town will actually sign off as tennis four on that approval, um, but it still is another approval. Okay. This, well, this is small potatoes, but, and again, it might just be my package, but there's no uh, deed, recorded deed. Oh, uh, there is. Um, I'm sure I there is one. It's not in the package is what I'm saying. Uh, it's in, 
it's in my package here. I can share my screen and show you the package that we. Uh, get it, get, get, get it, or we'll get it into the file. Uh, this is, uh, this um, is the deed that was. Elliot, uh, um, yep. coordinate with, um, just coordinate tomorrow with the building department to make sure they have a copy of it in their files. Because All right. if, if they don't have, it's not sufficient for us to see it on, on your screen. We can still move forward, but we'll need right. it in the file. Absolutely, not a problem. It, there's just no proof of recordation. That's the thing. The deed is here with no proof. Yeah, I got that. I have the deed also again with no proof of recording. Elliot, tell me about water issues on the property. One, are there any water issues? Two, is there a house there? You said you're taking it down and therefore putting up a new house. Um, what are the water issues, runoffs, all that good stuff? All right, um, let me uh, share my screen again, I guess. Uh, uh, share. Let's see. I, have, uh, I uh, went through it here. Let me uh, scroll through the bottom. There is an existing house, and there currently is a, a pipe uh, that uh, is from the roof leaders. Um, of the existing house that runs out onto the golf course right there. Um, so this is the this is the existing house, and right here is a pipe that um, a six inch uh, corrugated uh, plastic pipe that runs out into the golf course. Uh, there is uh, we didn't trace it, but that's the only explanation for the uh, um, for that pipe. Uh, the roof leaders of the house go underground, um, but we will be taking care of all of our uh, drainage on site. It'll all be in uh, underground uh, detention, uh, you know, dry well system uh, for both the house and the tennis court. Uh, there's no ground. We did do a deep test pit. There's no uh, groundwater that we found, uh, and we did some perk tests as well. Isn't there a requirement that you... Uh... If we apply our uh, stand standards, the town standards, that the runoff from the work that you're doing not exceed what currently the runoff is? Uh, we actually, I think that code requires that we treat it as a vacant lot, not as a developed lot. So we have that's taken that's care of all that's... of the runoff from uh, the, uh, um, considering yes, the property the originally now. undeveloped. The, the house, as we're talking tonight, the house is there. Um, I no, think the house um, is not there. It's down. The house is not there. It's been it's been demolished. Yeah, when I was there last weekend, there was no house. Right. So this was the original house, and that's why we also submitted uh, this this plan, which is well as the tree removal plan, but it doesn't show the house. Elliot, is the subdivision finalized already? Yeah, the subdivision's been uh, been. Filed, uh, I think almost for two years, uh, well, for a year. I'm not sure how long. Thanks. Um, yeah, me, the uh, development department received a copy of the filed plat, I want to say earlier this year, probably in a, around March, April timeframe. All right. Yeah, I don't have well, a. If I'm understanding correctly, the subdivision involves. This lot and the lot that's number three, that's vacant. Correct. Is that right? And so the subdivision resulted in one lot with one structure becoming two lots, one with an existing structure now demolished, and the second lot being vacant once the correct. subdivision took place. That's so correct. We were told that five was part of the same lot at some point, too. Uh, this is number five, right? This lot That's is right. number five. And then okay, number so three was three, now seven, number three, five, and seven were one, or was it only two building lots? Um, no, it was only two. It was basically five. It's essentially it was five or six tax lots uh, that made up all this property. There was, uh, I think, uh, three tax lots in Scarsdale and two tax lots in Americ. I don't quite remember the. Uh, the breakup, but it was made up of five tax lots. Some of them didn't have frontage. Uh, um, 
there was there there may have been some some this this half where this driveway is or was may have been some tax lot in the past or some improved lot in the past, but not in the recent, well, probably in the distant past. past. But it essentially was several different tax lots. Um, the reason for the different tax lots, I can't tell you, but it's, I think five or five or six original tax lots. At least, at least some of the structure that is now demolished was on a lot within the town of Mamaroneck. Yes, this is the lot. This, this picture that I have here is the original structure of the entire property. And this is the town line that runs through here. Um, so that was, uh, so this structure the, the, the town issue is the in the town or mostly in the town. Was that, was a town of Mamaroneck demolition permit issued? Uh, yes, that is correct. For the removal of the house that was within the town. That's correct. The town also approved the subdivision, if I remember correct. But how could the town approve the subdivision if it didn't come before us? Did it come before no, us? I'm just, I'm just, it just, somehow this reminds me of something that we dealt with a couple of years ago. Are you thinking and, of Stone Stonewall Drive? Oh, yeah, I'm thinking of the wrong thing. Okay. Uh, and as, as Eric just mentioned, it would seem to me if there was a subdivision, it would have to be approved by both the village of Scarsdale and the town of Mamaroneck. Um, for the board's information, uh, I do have a little bit of background on this. I know when the application first came to Scarsdale, as the majority of the land area within subdivision as a whole was in Scarsdale, um, there was an initial meeting between the building department of both village and town and uh, the planner for, for the village of Scarsdale. So the village took, um, took the lead as uh, the lead agency for the subdivision. Uh, we did receive notices, at least in the building department of you know, the various uh, steps that were taken, but um, they were the lead agency for that process. Uh, what you're saying is the approval of the subdivision of a portion of land in the town of Ameranek was done without any involvement of anybody from the town of Ameranek? I think he's saying, uh, I went, yeah. Sorry, I saying the town the town was on representatives of the town were on notice of what the what was being done in Scarsdale. And I gather the town then inherited a uh, newly created lot as a result of the Scarsdale subdivision that is predominantly, but not exclusively in the town of Mamaroneck. And then the town of Mamaroneck granted a demolition permit to create a vacant lot, a tabula rosa to build this new structure. And somewhere along the line, uh, the current owners presumably purchased a lot. Yeah, when we started this uh, subdivision process for this old property, we had contacted uh, Mamaroneck uh, uh, building officials and, and, uh, and uh, we, I'm sure I can find correspondence that um, directed us to um, do the subdivision in Scarsdale. Um, I don't know if Rob can, uh, you know, Rob, I think has those records as well. Yes, uh, that is a fair uh, description. I was actually at that meeting uh, between the building department and the village of Scarsdale. So I can attest that it did happen. Um, I think Ira's uh, description also was accurate to say of how the process worked. Um, our town assessor uh, received a, a, a copy of the plat when it was prepared by the applicant team and was in the loop as the plat was finalized with Scarsdale and then subsequently filed with the county clerk. From, from my perspective, it, that's irrelevant since uh... Uh, I was just concerned that the demolition took place without uh, proper procedure in the town. Rob says it was so. So in effect, we're being told that if on what's going on now, we declare ourselves lead agency effectively that uh, other than telling Scarsdale what's going on, that's the end of it from their point of view. Uh, yeah, and especially if it's just the Scarsdale Department of Public Works, then we don't even need to coordinate with them because that's not a discretionary agency, it's ministerial. Correct. 
uh, the town building department will be taking jurisdiction on the new house as it is primarily located within the town of America. That makes it a lot simpler. So Lisa, what do we have to do to declare ourselves lead agency and give the others a chance to object? Well, if there were any involved agencies, and it doesn't sound like there are, because um, it has to be uh, um, an agency that has discretionary um, jurisdiction, then we would just send them a notice of intent to act as lead agency. But um, there's no need to send that to Scarsdale Department of Public Works. So there's no other agency to coordinate with. We, we are the lead agency because um, the planning board is the only agency identified that has discretionary authority over this application. So we don't have to declare ourselves anything. Okay. So the question now is what next to going to coastal zone? Uh, we have a small amount of documentary stuff that potentially has to be taken care of. We have the comments uh, that Anthony made, which are, at least to my mind, not particularly significant. Uh, and should be able to be dealt with uh, rather rapidly. So the question is, do, uh, do the members of the board at this point feel we're ready to set a public hearing for September? I'm ready to mm -hmm. go. Other comments? Once, once the engineering consultant gets back to us, I, I mean, apparently he did, but we didn't get copies of the the um, analysis. I, I think we're okay for next next meeting. Any other view? Then may I have a motion to set a public hearing for September with, uh, subject to there being no additional so, problems discovered by the uh, coastal zone people or anybody else. So moved. Second. Second. As a point of information, Mr. Senator, why is a SWIP not required? Why is a what not required? The water analysis, a SWIP. Isn't that what the acronym is? SWPP? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan. Uh, in this case, it will be required. Uh, categorically, this falls into a major uh, stormwater permit under Town Code Chapter 95. Could you repeat so that? Will be required. You, you, you know, you're much more eloquent than you're coming across. Oh, okay. So yes, it must be the, must be the internet connection. I was saying that this falls based upon greater than one acre of land disturbance falls into what's what's defined as a major land development activity that requires a SWEP permit, as the acronym is. It's because it's more that better? Than acre, because it's more than an acre of what? More than one acre of land disturbance. And that that means it's excluded from the SWIP? It means that it is required. So there isn't one. You it's haven't done one, have you? Uh, the applicant has prepared several components that would be contained as part of the SWIP. And technically, because this is at the level that it requires coverage under the state permit, there's some additional conditions that have to be looked at. So that's part of our ongoing review. But we're, so, we're setting a public hearing without having that in hand? Yeah, I'm moving a little too quick. I would advise that materially most of the most of the technical matter that's part of the SWIP is, is has already been provided as part of the applicant's application. Uh, the things that still are lacking are mostly notes and maintenance requirements that Anthony and I will work with them on. But uh, I see it that it is at least uh, complete enough that I would not um, oppose a public hearing being being scheduled. I don't oppose a public hearing either, but I don't think these things should be uh, shunted onto the public. You know a very short time before the hearing. Because if someone came in, I don't know if anybody wants to come in and says, I haven't seen this or I don't understand it, or I have a question about it, we're undoubtedly going to uh, 
allow a period, an amount of time to elapse to give the public an opportunity to digest and raise questions. And you know, Mr. Senua went through this. Uh, if there were concerned neighbors, they might want to hire their own experts, such as he was from the Durham Road subdivision. And right. So um, just so you know, I am the engineer of record on the number three Cornell Street working in the village of Scarsdale. Uh, so I am working for one of the neighbors already. And what about number seven? Uh, number seven, I am not, and I am not working for the golf course. Okay, but the question I, I, is... I have no opposition to setting the public hearing. I'm merely suggesting that the hearing may not be, com if opened on that date, may not be completed. Yeah, I mean, as, as you know, uh, everything has to be complete and submitted at least 14 days before. So uh, that, that may or may not happen. If you can't get everything done, you can request a, an adjournment of a month for the public hearing. Is anybody uh, in the audience, uh, does anybody in the audience want to comment even on the presentation today? Have we asked that? Are they entitled to? It's, it's not a public hearing, so okay. no. All right. They can submit something in writing, though, as people have us to other things, but not comment at this. This is a meeting only of, in effect, ourselves. Just to put it on the record, 14 days, um, I think, is sufficient for the public to, for a technical document uh, for them to, I think it's sufficient, 14 days. I don't think uh, we should postpone the public meeting, and I think the board agrees with that, but I just want to put it on the record. It is 14 days. And that, that is the rule. They get it in 14 days. We wait. The board made the decision that 14 days is the amount of time that we deem reasonable. Oh, and I just uh, wanted to, no, I just thought of it. I did work on that house at number uh, seven uh, when that was built. I haven't worked on it since it was built, though. Take the petition to rename it Senor Street. I second that. Okay. Are we ready to resolve this and set our hearing for September without uh, further ado, subject to everything being submitted at least 14 days before? What, what is the September date, by the way? Pardon me? What is the September meeting date? Francine? September 23rd. Oh, so that's a pretty long time. September 23rd? Well, Sorry, I'm looking at zoning. September 9th. Francine, we got it. Please check. She, she said September 9th. September 9th. September 9th. Sorry, it wasn't clear to me at least. Francine, could you just say it again, please? The 9th of September. Okay, September 9th. So uh, there's not a whole lot of time. Can I just add one more thing? Our builder, okay. Elon Amidor, is on the line and he was having trouble with his microphone. Could I just put my phone to the microphone so he could say something? We, we, we did notify the neighbors uh, to the demolition of the house, and uh, nobody actually opposed it, and nobody actually contacted the, the town. And that's why we believe that there is no other people that are objecting this uh, application. Also, regarding the uh, scars there, we uh, notified, uh, we are in touch with. Uh, um, the public works we got her permit and they, they know about uh, the house and also the uh, water department they know about we filed all the application and everything is uh, good to go on the Scarsdale side so I don't believe that we have uh, uh, any reason to delay the public hearing for uh, next time so fine I mean you always have the option to come and delay it if you feel you want to or you can't 
meet the timeline. But if we don't set it, then you don't have a chance to have it. So why don't we go ahead and uh, hopefully set a hearing for, for September, subject to whatever turns up. Okay. Somebody wants to make a motion to that effect? Okay. I move, I move that we set the meeting for September, public hearing for September the 9th. I okay. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? You got it. See you then. Uh, thank you for the for your time. I guess uh, I'll, I'll stay on to see what the, the next application is about that you uh, thought we should be aware of. Okay, thank you. Well, item is, what's the address of this thing? Uh, 808 Weaver Street. Briar Country Clubs in, in connection with it. Everybody just bear with me once again. I, I am doing some changes here and moving the applicant's team into our meeting as panelists. The applicant was nice enough to send me a list of uh, attendees, so uh, please let me know if I left anybody out. Okay, um, I believe I've promoted everybody into the meeting. So gentlemen, if you could please uh, unmute your mics and uh, turn on your cameras. Okay, oh, got one more. Two more up here. Okay, is everybody joined? Yes, I believe we have everybody, thank you. Okay, let me just say uh, something to start this off. We're well aware that there is federal preemption with respect to various issues. And we're also well aware that there isn't with respect to other issues. Uh, we also are aware that it is the obligation of the Town of Maranek Planning Board to do its due diligence on this project, just like it is of any other project. And we've also, unusual, received a bunch of letters from people saying they're all in favor of being able to get cell phone service in an area that now basically has little or none. However, the however comes to the fact that having gone through this application in substantial detail, and parts of it are more engineering than I can necessarily fully understand. Uh, it's pretty clear that lots of it is incomplete. And one of the things I want to discuss up front is I can give you a listing of certain things that are incomplete or they will come up in connection with the discussion that we have anyway. Uh, but we would like to work out a reasonable time frame to try to get all of this uh, taken care of, given the fact that due to the COVID issues, everything is delayed. And that uh, we know that there is a presumption, but it's nothing but a presumption, about 150 days. But we haven't dealt with this until today, for one thing. And uh, there are some things that are gonna require additional plans, additional or corrected things, et cetera, which will take some time on your part. So I do think that perhaps that's something that our council, Lisa Hockman, should work out with 
whichever one of you I'm taking, David, are you counsel? Yes, I'm the attorney for the applicant. Okay. Uh, to work out exactly how to take care of this so that uh, nobody is on anybody else's tail and everybody tries to get this done working together. Uh, absolutely. We, we can speak offline, Lisa. Um, we're absolutely in favor of providing the board with reasonable time to review this application. Uh, we don't, don't want to shortchange anybody. I'm willing to speak with Lisa offline if, if there's anything else we can do for that. Fine. I think it's best that uh, you guys just speak to each other. Very good. And, okay. Uh, at this point, I have a bunch of questions which I've gone over. And I'm sure that some of the other people on the board do too. And probably what I'm going to uh, ask or comment on would be things other people would ask or comment on. So I'll save them the trouble. Uh, but Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, John Cuddy. I'd like to ask, first of all, who is the applicant? Uh, that's a bit unclear to me from the papers. Is this a joint application? So the application is by uh, Homeland Towers on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Okay. So it's not on behalf of Bonnie Breyer itself. No, Bonnie Breyer is the property owner and they've authorized us to make this application. Um, so in that aspect, it's on behalf of them as the property owner, but the applicant before you is Homeland Towers and on behalf of the FCC licensed carrier of Verizon Wireless. What, what right does... Uh... Homeland Towers on behalf of its uh, principals have to use of the real property owned by Bonnie Breyer Syndicate. So we have a lease with Bonnie Breyer and we've provided uh, documentation in the application that Bonnie Breyer has authorized this application. Have you provided the lease? No, we did not provide a copy of the lease. Instead, we provided the copies of the authorization forms by owner that are required in the application form, along with a copy of the deed. Are you uh, willing to provide a copy of the lease or an abstract or extract of the provisions of the lease? Uh, I could speak to my client and, and discuss that, but I don't think there'd be an issue with providing a redacted copy or an extracted version. Thank you. Okay. Chairman, again, a uh, point of personal privilege, I, I guess. Uh, I just need to make a, a statement that uh, I retired from Verizon Wireless two years ago uh, as an attorney. Uh, I continue to have deferred compensation from Verizon Wireless. Uh, reading the town code and uh, wanting not to uh, cross any line here with respect to conflicts of interest, I think it would be best if I recuse myself from this application. Lisa, what's your view on that? Um, so John, do you think that you have a financial interest in the outcome of this application? Well, Lisa, my problem is that when you read the town code, it's, 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 it's very broad and without exception. Um, and it talks not only about having a financial interest, but avoiding any appearance of a conflict. And that's, that's what concerns me, because I, I do continue to have a financial interest in Verizon Wireless, and that's, that's the issue. Okay. Well, um, I think if, if you're not comfortable making a, a very firm, clear, unilateral statement about your objectivity, then I would recommend recusal. Because the appearance, the appearance of a conflict, as you point out, is not determined by you, it's determined by others. Based on all of that, Lisa, I think it, it would be best if I did recuse myself in this instance, yes. Okay, so then my recommendation, John, is just, um, you can continue, of course, to observe the proceedings, but maybe just for clarity you should turn your camera off when when we're hearing this matter and uh of course to not participate in the discussion or ask questions except as a, me a member of the public so it would be the equivalent of stepping to the back of the room if we were meeting in person and what that means is is we'll need to designate that one of the alternates will need to step up not just for tonight 
Um, but we'll we'll have an alternate step in for each time this application appears on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, John, for raising. Which also means you can go home, John. And sleep. I am home. I really. <laughs> oh, that's right. So you can go tell your daughter that you've you've vindicated the spelling of the word architect. Okay, folks. What is being proposed here, as I understand it, and uh, I realize I'm taking this somewhat out of order because typically we let you guys make a presentation, but we have seen a vast amount of paper, uh, including a memorandum of law and various other things, going point by point through all kinds of stuff, which my guess is you would all be uh, telling us as well. But you know, I have this list of things to talk about. Why don't we, you know, no, why don't we let you talk first? Because maybe you'll answer some of the questions before they even get asked. Sure. Um, so the application is for Homeland Towers and Verizon Wireless to construct a 120 foot tall monopole at 808 Bonnie, uh, 808 Weaver Street, Bonnie Byer Golf Course. Is it 120 feet or 125 feet? Because the papers, say 125 feet. So the, the papers are correct. It's a 120 foot monopole with 125 feet to the top of the branches. So it's so a monopole. 125 foot structure. Well, the stru cor correct. It tops out to 125 feet, but the additional five feet from 120 to 125 is actually just the branches for the monopine design. The top of the steel for the monopole is 120 feet. So the, the appearance of the facility is 125 as designed as a monopine stealth design, but the top of the steel of the pole is 120 feet. And again, um, the application is needed to fill a significant gap in coverage um, in the area as shown in the radio frequency justification report that was submitted with the application in Verizon Wireless Network. Um, the facility has been strategically located on the Bonnie Briar uh, golf course to be minimally visible. Uh, we've submitted visual resource maps as well as uh, photo simulations of the facility from balloon tests um, to show that the facility is minimally visible and that such views of the facility are further mitigated by the monopine stealth design. Um, we've also submitted app, uh, materials to show that the facility is 100% compliant with the FCC's rules and regulations regarding radio frequency emissions. Um, and we have tonight with us the project engineer to answer any questions regarding the site plan or the layout. Uh, we also have the radio frequency engineer to discuss the need for the facility um, and the gap in services that is uh, going to fill, as well as we have the uh, visual resource assessment expert who produced the visual resource assessment um, that was submitted with the application that shows it's minimally visible. I have all three of those uh, experts with us tonight. Uh, we can continue the presentation by uh, discussing and going through the site plan and the layout, but um, if you had particular points where you said you had questions regarding items that you felt were incomplete, I would like to get that information from the board now um, to see if we could directly address any of those inconsistencies now. Okay, yeah. First one you actually uh, hit upon. The visuals are based on a balloon 120 feet off the ground. The top of the tower, or whatever you want to call it, uh, is 125 feet off the ground. So the fact that a balloon that's five feet lower than the top of the tower isn't visible, does not mean that the top of the tower isn't visible. And that, that, if I may cut you off, that, that needs to be uh, revised in the report. So the balloon was flown at 125 feet. I'm screen sharing the visual resource assessment now. Um, we actually had a pre-application meeting where we discussed the balloon float uh, with the town staff. Um, and a, a four foot diameter red balloon was raised to the elevation of 125 feet above grade. Um, any other statements in the report that refer to 120 um, will be revised, um, but when the balloon was flown factually at 125 feet, all the photos are of a balloon at 125 feet 
and the monopine photo simulations are of a monopine at 125 feet. Uh, we'll make sure that the report is clarified on that point. Well, the, it just seems to me, I mean, if this were an error that crept in one or two places in the visual report, I could understand what you're saying, but it's absolutely all over the visual report. I think and that has to do with a label. I have the expert who prepared the report, if, if you'd like them to speak to that. Well, I, I, you know, I don't see how you write and submit the report that says that the balloon was 120 feet, 120 feet up and then come back here and tell me, no, it wasn't, even though we've said over and over it was 120 feet, it actually was 125 feet. I mean, that, it, sorry, it just doesn't seem logical to me. I don't know about the other uh, people on the board here, but it's one or the other. And, you know, again, somebody can make a typo. This was not a typo. This was over and over and over again. Oh, I if, I, if I could. Yeah. Um, you know, this is Matt Allen with Saratoga Associates. I conducted the balloon study and wrote the visual assessment report. Um, in the text of the visual assessment report um, on page five, it describes the methodology of the balloon test and it states that the balloon was flown at 125 feet measured to the bottom of the balloon. Uh, so actually the top of the balloon was uh, higher than the uh, the tower at 125, top of the balloon was at 129 feet, just for a little safety buffer. The reference to 120 feet are, uh, that you're noticing is on the labels in the photographs where the balloon was visible. And that was a typo um, that unfortunately was, that label was just copied from photo to photo and we didn't catch that. Uh, but I can testify uh, having done the balloon test myself and having measured the string uh, which is measured uh, before the balloon test um, in the office and then uh, immediately prior to the balloon test in the field, it's remeasured. It was 125 feet and then a four foot balloon was uh, tethered to that. So the top of the balloon was 129 feet. Are you also responsible for the uh, cross-referencing in the text of your report between the, uh, the VP identifications of the photos, the description of the location and the labeling of the photographs? Yes. Well, um, VP 20 as the photo says Country Club Drive near number 15. That happens to be my house is depicted in this picture. Uh, and according to your table, VP20 is Weaver Street at Shell Drake Environmental Center, and VP10 is Country Club Drive near number 15. So those are mislabeled. Okay, I, that's uh, it certainly could be a typographical error. I'll cross-reference that with the map locations and make that correction. Well, I, I, I think it's not just one photo, I think. Things go wrong, we're, all, we're yeah. all aware of that. But with, you know, we have to get this straightened out. I, if this is done at 125 feet, and the next question I'll have is, why does it have to be 125 feet tall, as opposed to every other cell tower around here, including there are others in the town of Mamaroneck that aren't nearly that tall. And that also leads us to why is it being located so close to Weaver Street, as opposed to say somewhere in the middle of the Bonnie Briar Country Club, where it would be far less visible from the neighbors and the street. Uh, I think, I mean, those are several questions at the same time, but yeah. I'd like to get some answers. And, and there are also questions that I would like to have uh, separate uh, experts answer specifically. Oh, they're, they're the, the question regarding the height of the facility, um, we do have with us the radio frequency expert who prepared the radio frequency justification report, Gary Hartman. He can speak to why the 120 feet is necessary for the height of the facility. The 100, again, the additional five feet is for the aesthetics of the stealth design to the 125. 
Uh, good evening. Um, we repaired this report dated June 22nd, uh, 2020. I assume you have that with you. Um, what I'm looking at here is the main thrust of this report of the maps shown on page uh, 13, pages five, six, seven, and eight, excuse me. And uh, these are before and after maps. So what we do with this is we use EDX, which is an industry standard propagation tool um, that includes both terrain databases and land use databases to account for things like foliage and buildings. Sometimes we also refer to that as clutter, which I believe we did in this report. And these are before and after pictures. The maps say on page seven show the uh, coverage before we insert the site in the propagation tool. The red push pins are the existing Verizon sites. The blue push pin is the proposed site on the uh, Bonnie Bear uh, golf course. As you can see, there's significant coverage gaps uh, on the golf course itself and up to the northeast and also down to the uh, southeast, as well as some gaps over to the south of the site. The next page on page eight is when we turn this site on in the propagation tool. And as you can see, it covers a substantial amount of the areas where there are gaps in coverage. And as you can see from these red push pins, it is basically in the center of these uh, current sites, which are the red push pins. So at 120 feet, we cover, have a very good coverage of the gaps in coverage that we are trying to cover. When you start to lower before, or lower than 120 feet, we're actually at running 116 feet center line. Uh, in the RF world, we work on center lines, not tops. Uh, when you start lowering that, you will get to a situation where the trees begin to block the coverage and you have a substantial amount of foliage that you're going to have to go through and you would have a substantial reduction in the coverage that the site generates. So 120 would be a probably a good minimum size that you need to have the site at to cover all this area that we're covering with it. Hey, let me, if I may, the site does not necessarily have to be where the site is. In other words, if you took the same thing you just showed us and you took this tower and you stuck it in the middle of Bonnie Briar, it would seem to me, and again, you're the expert, I'm not, that you basically cover the same area. And if you dealt with the height, you're, you are making a proposal to have four different companies potentially hanging uh, antennas on it, presumably one on top of the other. Is that correct? Each antenna would be on top of the, the antenna of the other company, Verizon would be at the top? Verizon would be the top, the other antennas would be below Verizon. You okay. could probably move this but I, as far as uh, moving the facility, I think you're you're asking that from an aesthetic standpoint, um, from a radio frequency standpoint. That he is explaining that the need for the height of the facility and the gap in coverage. Um, we we also did some some uh, looking into other areas on the property. Um, there was restrictions from the property owner to areas that would actually be leased. And there's other areas on the property that also we, we thought would be actually more visible. And we took a look at these other areas on the property and the facility that we proposed is minimally visible and the location is such that it actually presents less visibility than if we would stand it in the middle. Uh, you know, at the middle of the property, we did some, you know, some research and it looked like it would be actually more visible if we stuck it in the middle. It's also a restriction on the areas on where we're allowed to, to put this property from our lease standpoint. Well, look, the lease to the side, are there other areas on the property where you would have equally, if not more effective coverage of the dead zones at the same height? Or I, I, we don't have that information right now. The information we have is that the facility as proposed 
would fill the significant gap in coverage that's been identified in the report. Um, as far as other areas on the property, um, it's been shown that it would actually be more visible if we tried to locate it in a more centrally located area in the property because of the way the vegetation and land cover is. The report, the report deals with one other site, which is much closer to Fannimore Road. Uh, the map there shows more areas that it would be visible from, and the conclusion reached in the report is this is be it's better closer to Weaver Street than the Fenimore Road. But I found nothing saying anywhere in between the two because the further you are from the street, I mean, the bulk of the people who traverse both of those major roads around here don't want to see this thing any more than anybody else does. And there's a lot of landscaping. I mean, you haven't even submitted a landscaping plan. There's a lot that can be done to hide it to some extent, even where it is. Uh, with landscaping, but it may be possible to do a much better job of that if it's much further away from the two major streets. Uh, uh, it, it, we, can also, look into, we can look into that, but as far as landscaping, the, the facility as shown in the visual resource assessment, you cannot see the base of the facility from any of the locations. Um, the facility is over 350 feet away from the nearest property line. Um, there, there's no need for any landscaping because there's no ability to see the landscaping or the base of the facility. I um, totally disagree with you. The point of what you see is the entire tower. The base of the tower and the machinery and so on, and we'll, we'll deal with some of that stuff yet, is a minor part of a 125-foot so-called tree, which when they have... Uh, the antennas hanging from it looks rather different. Rob sent us a picture of one of these uh, that's actually got a bunch of antennas on it. Looks quite different from what uh, what the general manager of Bonnie Breyer showed me, which actually looks like a tree. So the uh, you know in where we're going here is we our job is to shield to the extent possible the entire tower, not just the base of the tower. The base of the tower is visible or potentially visible through various holes between trees, some of which you're just showing on the screen. There are trees, there are gaps between the gaps between them, obviously. For example, in part of the area where there is the tower to be in your plan, there is a ridge near, uh, near Weaver Street, and if uh, one planted the top of that ridge with say 15 or 20 foot hemlocks or some equivalent thing, you would have the whole tower largely invisible from that area. Not, you, as now you can't see the base because the ridge is in the way, but there's much more that can be done from every single angle. The application before yours is from a continuous street, contiguous street where the property, even in your own picture, is a straight line to the entire uh, tower with nothing in between. The, uh, you know, it is our job to try to make the thing look as good as possible to the area. And we, we are going to need a landscaping plan designed to make the tower to the extent possible invisible. Obviously, it can't be totally invisible. Uh, so that you know is one of the things that most certainly is missing. It's also what I'm told, the language, I'm not sure I'm using the right thing, but it's a sight line plan, which is the equivalent of the plan that you now have, but with all of that landscaping in place to compare to what it is without that landscaping in place. The, you know, I, I just personally drove along there, went into the club, uh, took a look from, the, you know, the club is, is leasing you the place. If it's visible from within the club, they're leasing you the place, that's their issue. Our issue is the public and the public or the rest of the public. And uh, there are a lot of places where plantings could be done that could make the tower far less visible, even where it's located now. 
but I don't want to give up on the concept raised before of why is the tower not located where it would be in all likelihood the least visible, which is right in the middle or somewhere near the middle of Bonnie Briar. Just to clarify, I believe what the chairman is uh, describing would be um, profile of you drawing strong line of sight from areas of um, significant impacts, from adjoining roads where this home is located. So that would just be profile, profile view drawings of, of the tower in retrospect to those adjoining uh, spots. Exactly. I, I, we, we have no problem, you know, looking into a landscaping plan and providing that, but I believe the, the information we provide in this application um, shows that you cannot see the base of the facility. So I'm not sure even a 15 foot tall tree would provide anything to this application because there, you're over 350 feet away from the nearest property line and all viewpoints that we've documented, you cannot see the bottom part of this facility. You can't see the base of the facility. The top part of the facility has been designed with a stealth design so that it would blend into the background. It's been designed as a tree. We can, we can review this information and we can look into it, but I'm not entirely sure that there's gonna be any benefit if landscaping was proposed. Uh, what, well, that's why we're going to do or ask you to do not only a landscaping plan, but the sightline stuff in all directions where there are people driving, living, etc. The base, you keep talking about the base of the tower. The base of the tower is not key. The tower looks somewhat like a tree. It looks like a redwood tree in effect. It's 125 feet, as you pointed out, above the ground. That is much higher than any tree in the town of Mamaroneck or anywhere around the town of Mamaroneck. So it absolutely sticks out and there's nothing you can do about it if it has to be that tall. So we want to try to make the whole tower as invisible as possible, not just the base of the tower. I guess my question is, is then how would landscaping affect anything above the base of the tower? Oh, for example, if you're walking down the street, I'm, I'm just, giving a broad example, and you're six feet tall and you have 20 foot uh, hemlocks or equivalent things that you basically can't see through next to you and your line of sight goes way, not just limited to 20 feet. It's a, it's a long way across and you may not see this tower at all or you may just see the tip of it or something of that kind. I don't expect you to, to plant 100 foot trees right? That they don't exist. And it would be totally unreasonable. But that doesn't mean that can that plantings cannot be done along, well, even as I said before, along the areas where there are gaps between existing trees, along areas where the, there are existing trees, but they're not evergreens. So in winter, they're going to be much more visible than they are now. And it's going to take a lot of trees. And they're going to have to be big trees but they are available. And I think that's, you know, I don't know if you've hired a landscape architect yet. I don't know, you know, my guess is the person who did the visual uh, can do the sight line just as well. Uh, but that's basically it. If you're on the ground or driving past in the car or sitting in your house across the street, what are you going to see? I believe we presented that with the visual resource assessment and the actual photo simulations. We could try to supplement that with some line of sight drawings, but I don't think that that would any way be better than the photo simulations we provided. Um, we've taken actual real world photos of a balloon flown at 125 feet and documented where we believe uh, the tower could be visible from and where it will not be visible from. And then on those places where we found it may be potentially visible, we did a photo simulation of the monopine to give you uh, a visual representation of what the viewpoint would be like. I, I'm not exactly sure how, you know, additional land line of sight drawings would be better than that. Um, we could supplement if necessary. And also, I still have a question about the landscaping. Are, are you are you expecting the landscaping to be on properties not controlled by the applicant? Because I, I think you have a minimum of, even if they are 15 foot tall trees, as you said, on a line of sight, a six foot tall person, his line of sight gradually gets sloped upwards. We can have our visual resource uh, person you know, speak to that, but 
if the trees are near to where the facility is located, they're not going to have a beneficial effect. And I think what's shown in the visual resource assessment is you, you can't see those parts of the facility anyway as they are now. I, I really have to question what is the reason for this ask? Okay, let me explain. And I actually had a discussion on that similar topic with the general manager and COO of Bonnie Briar. Yes, you're absolutely correct. The landscaping has to be on Bonnie Briar property, which is not in the area that you're talking about leasing, because the area you're talking about leasing would, as you point out, not do a whole lot of good. But there are areas that would do a whole lot of good. And most of them are much closer to adjoining properties and the adjoining streets. And at least the reaction I got from him, and it's probably a board of governors that he has to answer to, was that they would not have any problem provided it doesn't interfere with the golf course, et cetera. And we actually went over one particular site that he proposed where he said, yeah, that would really help with the line of sight and the invisibility, and it wouldn't interfere with the golf course at all. So my guess is, and this I would suggest that you do, or uh, whoever, you, you know, one of you do, or, or a landscape person do, do this in conjunction with the club. It would not be on the leased land. Well, I agree with you. Doing landscaping, if the kind I'm talking about on the leased land wouldn't do a whole lot of good, if it would do any good at all. Thank you for that clarification. I'll speak with the property owner and the client and see what we can do. Thank you. Uh, were, were there any additional questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a question. Sure. Um, are you limita limiting on the tower only to wireless carriers? Um, are you talking about emergency communications providers? Well, Maybe no, I, I, in addition to the emergency communications, if you're going to have T-Mobile or AT&T, are, are you going to have any, any other entities other than wireless carriers and emergency? Are you going to lease space to anybody other than wireless carriers? So, so there's no plans for that at this time, but this is a tower that provides co-location space. Um, so if there's a need for the facility, potentially this tower could provide uh, that need. So we don't have so let, me, let me ask you something. You say you have four tiers or, or four arrays, and then there are 12 panels on each array. Does that mean that there are 48 separate antennas on this pole? So there are the potential for up to four co-locators. What's being proposed now is Verizon Wireless's antennas. They have 12 antennas. So they're right now only being proposed 12 antennas. We have provided the, uh, the ability for co-location so there could be up to 48 antennas, but we are not proposing 48 antennas with this application. We're just providing a tower that has the ability for if AT&T or T-Mobile came to the town and they also had a need for a gap in service or a need to fill a gap in service in the area, that this facility then would provide co-location space, thus helping alleviate the need for an additional one-off tower in the town. So you will only limit access to this tower to wireless carriers? No, that's not what I stated. What I stated is, is that- I know that's not what you stated. What I'm asking is, will you do that? No, uh, the I last thing we want is a dirty tower. I don't want this tower to look like the top of the hill in Staten Island when you're finished with 48 different antennas on it. Can, can I ask? So if you could just explain for us, it's not clear to me what that even means. And, and maybe this will help clarify, you know, what could be put on the tower. So what does four antenna arrays mean? And what does the 12 panel antennas mean? Sure. Let me uh, screen the share, uh, share the screen. Um, so uh, we hey, have our engineer on here, Robert. You want me to answer that, Dave? Yeah, if we're going over, the antenna arrays are right here. So the antenna arrays are the, uh, uh, the, the, the antenna grouping, if you will, per wireless carrier. Right now we're proposing 
uh, Verizon Wireless at the 117. That would be the center line of their antennas. And One, at 117 feet high? Correct. Okay. Above the ground. Uh, right now, that's where they're proposing. Their antennas, I believe these are six-foot panel antennas, probably anywhere from 11 inches to a foot wide. I, I know we, have the de we may have the antenna detail on here. And then in addition, the tower is going to be designed for three other co-locators at 10 foot increments below 117. And in order to design the tower properly, we're going to go with the maximum amount of antennas that they, they could possibly go with, which would be 12 antennas in, in four sectors. So it would be four antennas per sector. So there would be four lines of antennas if yeah, you just if you, go back to the picture that you had you at, with yeah. the Verizon and the Verizon okay. antenna on it. Okay. They, so the antenna so, is apparently not against the trunk of the tree. No, the it antenna goes on, is apparently it, on the outside of the tree, at which point it no longer looks like a tree. No. Uh, they they will be within the branches of the proposed tree. Uh the it's antenna not where your picture is. Well, we don't show the branches in the picture because for clarity, you wouldn't be able to see the antennas. The Can I have a better view? I could explain more. Uh, the antennas go out approximately eight feet and those antennas will be screened within them. In addition, the antennas will be painted and they put antenna socks on them, which are essentially a covering that has small evergreen branches on it as well so that they'll blend in as well. And they do stick out from the tower slightly because the antennas are not the only thing on the tower. They also put some remote, what they call remote radio heads, which are essentially radio uh, cabinets, very small radio cabinets, which are again, painted and, and, and uh, uh, I don't think those have socks. Those are just painted uh, and attached to the interior of the antenna array, if you will. The antennas are obviously on the outside because they're what's shooting the radio waves. Can I ask, you're initially designing this for four arrays. Do you have the ability to add additional arrays in the future? At, at this point, the tower hasn't been designed. So the ability is there and it would be up to the client or whatever kind of approvals and conditions get put on it by the town, obviously. But for now, the, if the design were to go in tomorrow, it would be designed for four carriers with 12 antennas per sec, 12 antennas per level. So does Homeland Tower, uh, is, do they sublease or do they lease this antenna entirely to Verizon and then Verizon subleases it to the carriers? Or does Homeland retain the ability to dictate who is going to attach to the tower? So Homeland will own the tower and Verizon will be a tenant on the tower and the future co-locating carriers would also be tenants on the tower. They would have leases or contracts or agreements with Homeland Towers. And has Homeland ever developed towers that lease to other than wireless carriers? And if so, what are those kinds of entities that it leases to? Uh, we have a representative from Homeland here, but absolutely they do. We also encourage and try to provide space for emergency communications equipment. So that sometimes would be police, fire, EMS, local municipal communications equipment. This is a communications facility, so it can support all types of communications equipment. What uh, other types of equipment though, aside from the life safety issues and the cell phone equipment? So it would be radio communication equipment. Klaus, would you like to speak to any more of this? Klaus, you're still on mute. The bottom left hand. Or press the space bar. And I'm using him as well. Okay. Yeah, there might be some communication issues, but essentially it's it's for radio 
radio radio communication equipment. Majority of the clients are telecommunications providers, um, but sometimes we do provide uh, space to emergency communications equipment. But there can also be space if there is a need in the facility, and this is all speculative at this point, but if there is a need for someone else who has radio frequency communications equipment, and that need is, it could be filled by this facility, um, there would be the opportunity for that. Let me just add something right on that. The, the facility basically is in the position where it serves the town of Mermerinick, it serves the, the village of Scarsdale, and it serves the city of New Rochelle because it's basically where they all three meet. All of them probably have the same communication problem there because actually I've tried it with Verizon, with AT&T and with T-Mobile and at least none of those three work. Uh, so my guess is whatever else is around doesn't work either. So one thing we're gonna do is invite each the emergency services of each of those places to let us know what they think. But my question is, Let's assume for the moment that the various emergency services want to utilize your tower. What, if anything, do they have to pay for that? Uh, we, can, we can speak with them regarding that, but usually it's, it's rent free, just the cost of installation. Okay, so they provide the equipment and, and, the, and it gets installed and then no, long, no ongoing costs. Correct. What is the term of the lease between Homeland and uh... Bonnie Breyer. Uh, I don't have that in front of me right now, but I, I can provide a response. I believe it. it's usually a, a lease that has several automatic renewals in it and several terms. David, you point you, you shared a drawing before that showed the antenna arrays. So just to clarify, there were four panels that you propose Horizon would be using in the future. Um, are, are those four panels, the four antenna arrays? So the antenna arrays are essentially different uh, word for sectors. So the idea of it is that each of these antenna arrays is really a direction that the antenna is. So this would be one antenna array. This I'm sorry, I don't see the drawing. It's not, it's just, I see a list of documents. Sorry. You, you can't see this uh, screen, the, the drawing that I'm, sh I'm sharing. Do other people see the screen? We don't the see it. Files. Can you see it now? No. No, oh, just a list of documents. It's a listing of files under the heading folder NY160. Can you see the screen now? No. No. Very no. How about now? Yes. Yeah. So right here, th this is a direction. That's what an antenna array is. So this right here, these two antennas on this amount is one antenna array. This is another antenna array. And this is another antenna array. So the comments regarding the 12 antennas um, and the max amount of, of 48 antennas, that was a structural calculation. So that is the, the design for this facility for structural capacity. But what is being proposed right now are two antennas per sector as shown right here. And additional radio head units as Mr. Burns described earlier, uh, closer to the face of the monopole. There, there are no dimensions on that drawing or at least any that I can read. But with that bird's eye view, that shows a, red, a square. What's the approximate size of each side of the square? 10 feet across, five feet across? Uh, Bob, could you speak to that? I, I believe yeah, what's the, so, the, the mount. So, the, the, mount? Um, the mount itself, I believe, uh, if you go to C2, Dave, it's kind of a blow up of the, uh, do you have all the drawings there? Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Stop. There you go. So each one of these, the 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 
horizontal part of the T is, uh, I believe those are eight feet in, in length. And the vertical part of the T coming off the tower is three feet. And so each of those arrays is uh, 20, you said it was eight, each side is eight feet? If I'm not mistaken, they're eight feet on the horizontal side and then they come off the tower. I think it's two and a half to three feet. So that, and how, that, and I how do they go down though? Feet. I'm sorry? That is, that is approximately 64 square feet across. Yeah, and I can get you the exact dimensions on that. Approximately 64 square feet. and I would say that's pretty close, yeah. And you said it's three feet up? I think so it's, it's two and a half to three feet. It sits on a collar around the around the pole, yes. So, so each of those arrays is uh, roughly 200 cubic feet. And there would be three, three, three lower levels equivalent. Three right? lower, three lower levels that were designing equivalent. They may or may not need the same uh, uh, sector arrangement or the or the number of sectors. Sometimes they only need three sectors as Verizon, depending on the frequency of their wireless service. Yeah, at this point, it's completely speculative of what a future care carriers or anyone other than Verizon will need. So what Homeland has done is built it so it could support a maximum capacity. So we've tried to provide the maximum space for those co-locators. But as far as what they actually will install, we, we don't have that information. We're just trying to make this facility so that it has the best potential for co-location and they can co-locate. When you mention maximum potential, I mean, who determines the maximum? Is there is this the maximum based upon like FCC standards or what 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 dictates the maximum size of the monopole? I, I'm talking in, in terms of structural yeah, capacity. The capacity on yeah, so it is customary that the tower structural design caps would be submitted considering both current and future contemplated loads so that when future collocators were to come, they would be compared to that structural analysis. No, but, but Rob, if they build at 150 feet, you could install more, right? So, I mean, that could be the maximum. Like what makes 125 the maximum? So, so I think you're confusing the, the <laughs> amount of, of carriers and amount of weight that can be supported on the pole and what is the maximum height. So we had our radio frequency expert earlier testify that Verizon needs a minimum height of the 116, 117 foot rad center, which gives us the 120 foot pole. So we can't justify anything taller than that based off of Verizon's coverage needs. So that's why we proposed that height. If an additional carrier comes later and they say they need a taller tower, that would be an application that would have to justify on those merits. Um, but right now we built the facility for Verizon's needs and to co-locate below Verizon. But there's always the possibility that if it's necessary, towers can be extended. Oh, so are you saying that, that what you just said is if we approve this at 120 or 125 feet or whatever it is, it turns out to be. Number one, we are approving it with four possible, just the way it's done now, with four possible sets of antennas, with the top one being Verizon and the other three being whoever it is they turn out to be. Uh, and somebody could come and ask for more. So this could turn out at some point to be 150 feet tall. No, so what I'm, what I'm stating is, is that we're proposing for Verizon. A benefit of the facility is that not only will it be able to support Verizon's equipment, but up to three additional co-locators. We don't have their information, so the application is being approved, would only be approved for Verizon antennas and the facility with Verizon on it. But there is the potential for co-location. And so that co-location can go below, and there's no application to extend it, but if there's a need to, there could be. Well, assuming that you had the, the requisite approval from the town of Mamaroneck, Verizon was up and running and it's 120 or whatever number of feet. 
And then these co potential co-locators come along and say, me too. Uh, what responsibility either under your lease with Bonnie Breyer or under the law, as you understand it, do you have to come back to the town of Mamaroneck or Bonnie Breyer to get a sign off to add to what's already there? So every co-locator would have to come to the town of Mamaroneck and receive some sort of building approval. You yes. have a building permit that would be. Sorry, just to chime on this note. Yes, yeah, so David, I was just going to clarify that town staff that I would re recommend that any any application for co location would obviously require a new ground mounted uh, cabinets and equipment as well as change the tower for the new antenna. So it would be my initial impression that that would be an amended site plan, which would then obviously come back to the planning board. Yeah, but if, if you think about it, the first one is the one that actually makes the difference. Mm -hmm. I do suggest, Rob, you had sent me, I don't know if you sent to other people, a photograph of a similar tower with, I think, four different carriers on it, which looks yes, quite um, different. For the record, this was a, um, a recently completed camouflage monopole on Bloomer Road in the town of North Salem. I believe the applicant's team had at one point stated with staff that that was uh, possibly constructed by their same uh, by their same team. Okay, but I, I just would want to make sure that everybody on planning is aware of what this potentially will look like if it has the four sets of antennas on it, which is very different than it looks like with nothing on it or even with one set of antennas on it. And that gets me back to what I said before. The issue isn't the base of the tower. None of these antennas are going to be hanging from the base of the tower. All of these antennas are going to be 100 or so feet in the air. And all of them are going to make this much look appreciably less like a tree. Because you have that in your own illustration. So when we talk about why screening and what is it that you're trying to screen, it's as much of the tower itself and those antennas as reasonably can be done. And I include the word reasonably. Uh, so yeah, I do think that this is something which entails taking, ev taking every place from which this is visible and making a proposal by a landscaper of how to make it less or invisible. And I can tell you just from just from Weaver Street, because that's the part I drove a few times to see what it was. There are a whole bunch of places where it's going to be visible, but it wouldn't have to be. Uh, we, we can look into that, but again, I would I would state for the board that you know the the tower is as we've represented in all the application materials we've shown, it is minimally visible, um, and you know th this. The standard before the board is, is not if it can be seen anywhere, but you know whether or not the visibility of the tower r rises to the level of a significant impact. And I don't believe you have that here. I believe you have a stealth design in an appropriately located large property where it's, on, it's over 350 feet from, to the nearest property line. And any views of the site is mitigated by using the stealth design to have the facility resemble a tree. Um, we, we are going to make the stealth design, make sure that it resembles a tree as been testified to earlier. Uh, the antennas are, themselves will not only be sit inside the faux branches, but they will also be covered. Um, so we, we do submit that we're, we are respective to making sure that the visibility and the visual aspects of this application are paid respect, but uh, we, we would submit that we've done that by promoting the stealth design and locating it on the property as such. David, I have a question. Is there another location that you can uh, reference uh, with a similar height um, and also with the stealth design that Homeland has installed? Yes, I can have that for the board. We, we, we've done monopine designs before. Can I ask a question about the um, Pinnacle Antenna Site Assessment Report? Um, it seems to me that they did an analysis for maximum permissible exposure using 1900 megahertz or yeah, megahertz 
as the model, and yet they say Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Verizon uses 2100. Um, AT&T has a max of 2300. T-Mobile has 2100. Verizon also uses 3.5. This is significantly lower than the, the amounts that would be used. So why is the maximum permissible exposure analysis less than that which we know the initial carrier and the co-carriers would have, have? I don't understand that. I, I'm not sure I, I, I understand your question. Could you repeat it? Yes, uh, in this report, they do an analysis of maximum exposure, potential exposure. And they give us the example, 1900 megahertz. And then um, they you, show- you yeah. Tell me what page you're referencing the 1900 megahertz. Hold on just a second, let me get to it. All right. I, I have a question. I have a question when she's done about site coverage, please. All right, by way of illustration, page seven, figure one shows the vertical plane pattern of a typical 1900 megahertz panel antenna. And then it shows us that. And then we go on to, I'm assuming they're still using 1900 when they get into the ground level MPE compliance assessment. But if they're using 1900 as the model, that's less than what we're going to have with those three carriers. So that's not what the report says. So 1900 megahertz is a frequency band that Verizon operates on. So as you can see in the report, we list all of the frequency brands that Verizon uses, as well as AT&T and T-Mobile. Right. Um, the report actually was done based on the transmission of the worst case scenarios for all three car carriers um, based on all of their frequency bands. So, you know, the figure one is, is just one visual representation of one of those bands. So this is just one a visual representation, but the whole report was done based off of the combined uh, emissions from all of the frequencies. And so when we've done that, we've shown that in the report that the, at the street level, the worst possible from, again, this is under the worst case scenario from all of the carriers, it is only 5.6% of the FCC limit. And then at but the- It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that they've used the highest from each of the car carriers at all. It just says, this is what we think at this point. Um, it no, it, say says, it says right here. So MPE limit uh, caused by the combination of antenna operations, well below the hundred. In other words, the calculation design to significantly overstate the RF versus those that could actually occur at the site. The worst case calculated RF level in this case is still more than 15 times below the limit defined by the federal government. Which so, is a six foot six human being as opposed to the thousands of children that live in the district? Wait, no, the six foot six human being, that reference is to be conservative. That's above the average height. And so the antenna radiation, it comes downward from the 120 foot downward. So the six foot six person that is being used, that's basically, they're, they're using that as a conservative estimate of a person's height. This, I don't know what you've just said. It seems to me a six foot six person is an adult who can absorb this. Uh, we've got a count with children. To adult or children, they're referring to six foot six as the height as a person that is above the average height of an of average American of an average individual, thereby it being a conservative number. Closer to the source of the energy. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
But this calculation does not, in fact, actually say in English language that they've taken the worst of every single one of the of these three carriers to do this analysis. It Nowhere does, does it say that. Report. It says it says that in the report. So no, it doesn't. Oh, well, I'd like you to tell me include the that. RF effects of a worst case hypo, hypothetical co-location of two wireless carriers in tennis. By worst case, we mean the carriers who maximum capacity relates to the higher emitted power levels. So they tell you right here that they are going ahead and they're doing a, a, a capacity based off of the two wireless carriers. And then they've gone on ahead and said right here under the worst case scenarios. So this is more than just Verizon's and tennis. On the worst case scenarios, we are still only 5.6% of the, of the federal limit. So they've used two out of three carriers to do this analysis? They've used the worst case scenarios under the co-located conditions, which again, we are providing you a tower right now being proposed for just Verizon. For Verizon. So they're only using one entity to do this analysis. Is that correct? I think the co-location of the two wireless carriers is two in addition to, to Verizon. Well, I, I don't think this is crystal clear because I'm not following it. And I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Liz, can I, can I just suggest Liz, something? This is way beyond the Ken or Ken. Correct. I don't know if uh, Rob Wasp uh, has a greater grasp of this uh -huh. than we do, but uh, I'm beginning to think that uh, uh, to do this fairly and correctly, we need to retain an independent consultant to evaluate what has been submitted as justification by a quote, interested party, close quote, uh, to acquire some more knowledge and expertise to ask the right questions. I don't know what you're saying, it's actually fairly standard procedure. There are companies yeah, that do advise that. that. That RF and um, electromagnetic radiation compliance are, are, are specialty areas of engineering that are outside of my breath, although I have some degree of familiarity. Um, I would advise that it's not something that I'm an expert in. There are other Westchester communities, from what I've been told, that have hired an expert firm, having nothing get paid by, but not chosen by the applicant, to advise boards such as ours as to what all of this means in English and whether everything is actually as compliant as the report says it is, which it may well be. I don't know. I, you know, I don't know the technical stuff either. But again, from what I'm told, and Rob, I think has some names, uh, there are people that we can, if we determine, we, the planning board, can determine to retain, to review these reports, report back to us in language we can understand, and hopefully say everything's wonderful. If not, tell us it's not. In, in addition, Mr. Kenny, uh, assuming the tower were erected, the lease between Bonnie Breyer and uh, uh, your client were in effect. Um, and I gather it could potentially go on for many years. What additional rights of control, veto, et cetera, if any, does Bonnie Breyer have under the lease? Uh, I can't speak to that right now. I'd, I'd have to review the lease and, and get back. To it. I'm, I'm also not sure exactly what uh, what particular rights of control you're looking for? Well, I'm not looking for anything, but I'm trying to get a sense about if this tower goes up, uh, must the Verizon decide what goes on there without any input, notwithstanding the views of Bonnie Breyer, or does Bonnie Breyer, uh, which let's say arguably uh, may have some uh, greater sympathy with the views of the community, uh, has something to say about what happens on the tower on their property. In addition to whatever regulatory authority uh, the town of Amarodek or whomever has. I can look into that for the board. Can I can ask a question about uh, site coverage? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I was curious about, um, I know that, that you, you've provided some, some graphics in here on existing site coverage and proposed site coverage. How many um, 
residents are going to be left without coverage after the tower is built and operational. There's still going to be a lot of people without coverage. Um, is there, can you, can you come up with some percentages of people that are going to wind up with still no service? I don't believe we have those figures uh, for you tonight. We can look into that and provide some kind of more information as to the significance of the gap in coverage. Yeah, I see it improve, improve some areas a lot and some areas like near Griffin and Fenimore, like not at all. So um, Pinebrook Boulevard, not at all. You know, there's, there's definitely areas that just still won't have any service. I, I think that just speaks to the, the significance of the gap in coverage that exists in this area. It, it is large. Uh, I think you have uh, 13 letters from the members of a public testifying to the, the significance of this gap in coverage. So I, th and, I think- And how many of them are still gonna not have coverage? Um, is there a better location for the tower that would provide everybody with coverage or for another five feet in height, do you get better coverage? So we have, I have my radio frequency expert to speak to, they, they can justify the minimum height that we propose for Verizon. Um, so that's why we're proposing that height. Um, as far as any additional areas that aren't being covered, I think that has to do more with the significant gap in coverage that exists in this area. Uh, we've also submitted an alternatives analysis where we did review uh, the possibility of locating it on alternative properties and there weren't any alternative properties that were available to us that provided a better application than this one. Is, is the water tower at Wingfoot uh, ever been a consideration? Absolutely. So we did as part of our alternatives analysis. Hold up here. So I can't hear him. But yes, we, we did. Um, we, we did review that and I'm pulling up the alternatives analysis now. So yeah, we, that was one of the sites that was also reviewed right here, the water tank at Wingfoot uh, Country Club. But we never received any response from the club regarding this. Well, even if you, if you didn't have response from the club, um, because the, the water tower is not owned by the club, right? It's owned by the water, is it owned by the waterworks? That's just the general order works. Um, what, what would it be? Can you do the analysis even without the ownership of Wingfoot? We can review that, but I believe there was another reason. It was not only that it wasn't available, but there was also a radio frequency reason um, that that water tank isn't tall enough to provide the coverage necessary. All right. Um, what about a combination of the two sites? I don't have that information for, for the board tonight. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. In in terms of um in terms of uh locations that were studied, what other locations on Bunny Briar were studied by Homeland? Aside from uh, this particular spot. I'm just pulling up the alternatives analysis again, sorry. So yeah, we did review and, and it was just, it was an inability to, if you could see here. So if we first reviewed it based off of the 1200 foot setback and there was no other possibility to locate this on the property somewhere where it would meet the 1200 foot setback. And then out, we also reviewed it and I don't have the view shed maps with me right now, but we reviewed it and we found that it would be potentially more visible in the central located area on the on the golf course. So from all, all of the information we provided, the proposed location on the Bonnie Briar Golf Club, we found to be minimally visible and the better location. Can you go back to that 100 foot setback drawing? And if you could please walk us through that. So the, are you required to set it back 1200 feet from the property line? 
except the town law, which has been preempted by federal law. Correct. Can I ask the initial base station that you're building, is that only to accommodate the Verizon equipment? And will it have to be expanded as you have uh, co-located carriers added to, to the antenna? No, so we, the base station is a term for the entire facility itself. So if you're, are you referring yeah. to the, the ground equipment? Or are you referring the to- The equipment, the, where you have the ground equipment located near their, their back maintenance sheds. So, so no, we have um, shown on the drawings that we have the potential for co-location space. I'm just sharing the drawing real quick. CP1. Yep. So we have- Right there. We have future lease areas for future equipment for the carriers, as well as if there's a need for future municipal equipment, emergency communications equipment. So you're building just one shed now for Verizon, but you, you're reserving enough property to build three additional sheds? Correct. And we're not building a shed. This is uh, equipment cabinets, so they're not enclosed within a oh, shed. Oh, so they'll just be surrounded by like wire or something? Yeah, so we'll have, have it, a, a wire overhang, we, so we have a cable overhang above it, but it's uh -huh. open air. Okay. They look like, they look like uh, shipping containers, don't they, more or less? No. No. No, it'd be like chain link fencing, right? They're like small refrigerators with a canopy oh. over the top. Oh, okay. That's the best way I could describe them. What powers them when the electricity around here works? So we're proposing also uh, a generator. And it's right here. It's, it's a two propane, 120 gallon uh, propane tanks. Yeah, so if the power goes out, they're, they're backed up by a battery cabinet. And the battery cabinet is recharged with a small generator fueled by propane. Okay, but we have just had a storm as you probably noticed. Yep. And large portions of, the, of our area have been without power for at least eight, some people nine days, some people still don't have it at 10 days. Yep. Uh, is there going to be sufficient fuel to operate that generator for two weeks? So with the size of the generator and the amount of propane, you get about, uh, not including what you get in backup with the batteries, you get about 54 hours of backup. So, so you're that, talking, what's that, three days, two and a half days? Fine. So it would seem to me that one of the things that ought to be looked into is how to have some significantly larger supplies of propane so that since these storms happen around here, and many other places all the time. And we lose power all the time. So you're gonna lose power all the time. And it can take a week or more fairly regularly to get power back. And Verizon, as well as everybody else, presumably wants their tower to be working for cell service. It would seem to me that we ought to have tanks here sufficient to power the, the uh, tower or portions of the tower, it sounds like each uh, person that provides his own stuff uh, for two weeks. Four hours is nothing. We can, we can get, absolutely look into the, the, the amount of time for backup power. That's actually a federally preempted topic. So we can look into that. I'm absolutely not, you know, uh, refusing to look into providing additional power, but Homeland had and Verizon has provided more than enough backup power to the facility. And this is a federally preempted topic. How do you provide the uh, propane to the site? How do you get it there? They bring it in with a truck and then they use a hose to fill the tanks on site. Okay. Just like normal propane tanks. Correct. Yeah. Well, I can make a recommendation um, just in, an, in, in a general effort to try to minimize the output of additional noise from multiple generators running the applicant team may want to look into or at least consider the option of a combined generator that could provide for multiple co-locators uh, so that it, the effects of having multiple generators running could be minimized to one so also simplify the need to refuel we can look into that but that actually would uh, take away from the chairman's initial comment but providing more power so if all four, you know, 
carriers were co-located on this facility and one generator supplied power, that would limit the amount of power or how long that power could run. I um, mean, all, all of the uh, carriers have different energy requirements, so it may not be technically possible to have one generator supply for all four carriers if it's four carriers at the facility. We can look into that, though. Thank you. If, is there any study of the noise level from this tower? Is there going to be a buzzing that people can hear on the golf course or in their homes? So, so no, uh, these types of facilities, they do not pr promote, uh, produce any noticeable noise, vibration, odors, or anything like that. Um, we can have uh, our engineer speak to the generator. That would probably be the loudest thing from this equipment. But again, the generator would only be used uh, with yeah, I mean, emergency, yeah. emergency times. But mm -hmm. um, no, uh, under standard operation, there wouldn't be any noticeable noise. That's correct. I had a question about the co-location. Um, in your experience, typically, how long does it take for, again, you mentioned that you know four companies could locate their equipment on the tower. Typically, in your experience, how long does it take to, how long until all these companies start utilizing the entirety of the tower? Uh, it's really dependent on on every particular location, the needs of the carriers. For this particular site, we already do know that AT&T has interest to co-locate below Verizon's center if this facility is approved. Um, so we do know that there is interest already from at least one additional carrier. And they've already mentioned that they'd be fine by locating themselves below Verizon. Um, but right now, I'm not sure when any additional carriers beyond that would, would show interest. Rob, have you received construction diagrams and so on sufficient for the building department to look into the construction portions of this? At this point, the actual design drawings for the tower are, are limited. I believe we only received a structural certification letter that states that the design of the tower will comply with all applicable codes. Uh, so we have not yet received uh, complete building details, but. Uh, that would not be expected until a permit application were to be submitted, you know, after board approval. Okay, so you have what you need at this point. Correct. Um, I will point out for the applicant's information that um, the town's engineering consultant, in collaboration with the engineering department, has prepared a list of comments in the form of a memo that I will share with you uh, following this meeting. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, do we need to inquire of the applicant uh, their willingness to uh, pay for uh, outside expert that we select? The, my understanding, Lisa, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, is that we have the power to hire such a person and under applicable law, the bill goes to the applicant. Uh, I mean, obviously it could be ridiculous and the applicant could object, but uh, apparently at least, isn't it Rob, Rob, aren't you the one who told me that uh, we have another Westchester community that did the RF analysis that we were talking about before uh, for another, you know, uh, by a company that you know. Uh, uh, yeah. so I think we could probably get a quote and send it to them because they don't want to have a, you know, they're not going to write us a blank check. Correct. I mean, as a standard with all special permits, uh, that chapter 240 of the code has a condition that technical consultants hired by the board, uh, that reasonable costs are the responsibility to be reimbursed by the applicant. So, you know, the key there being reasonable. And by the way, I mean, we there are consultants on lots of things, not just this tower. Mr. Kenny, have you experienced that before with Homeland? Uh, we, yeah, we've had several applications where there have been outside consultants and uh, as Rob stated, as long as it was reasonable costs, that, that would be acceptable to the applicant. Okay, Rob, am I also correct that there is a, a bonding requirement from connection with the removal of all of this and, and maintenance issues and so on, a maintenance plan that's supposed to be produced? I mean, for uh, example, correct. is that correct? Yes. Uh, Yes, um, typically I would recommend that the board would, would consider a tower removal or abandonment bond that in the event that, you know, this, um, that the carrier were to abandon the facility for any reason or go bankrupt or be in a situation that the tower has to be removed, that that bond could be called upon assuming that that need should arise, although unlikely as it may be. Um, it, I believe our code also 
also addresses that uh, that an ongoing structural evaluation of the tower would would occur on a regular basis um, as defined in the code. Okay, I, uh, I know that somebody had raised with me to raise with you what a stormwater management plan in connection with construction, as well as whatever, you know, is going to happen after construction is completed. Clearly, there's going to be some disruption of, a, of the landscape for a while. Uh, and we don't have such a plan that I've seen anyway. So, I mean, I think that there are you know, things to be done. Well, I think that maybe to get this moving, which I think is everybody's desire, uh, let me ask the board whether there is a desire to have a, I think it's called an RF engineer. I'm not quite sure what the term, actual term is, retained by the town to, do, to review the analysis and report back to this board as to, well, its accuracy and to answer your questions, Liz, and the others that were asked about all this stuff uh, and potentially to utilize the same one that Rob has been apparently involved with using before and to get a quote first uh, as to what this would cost. Is that something that the board would like to do? Yeah. I think yes. 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 I think that makes sense. Okay, so I think that's something we could do now to get that going. Okay. We will, we will proceed with that. We will uh, seek the calls and inform of a proposal for a review of RF compliance and electromagnetic radiation areas. Okay, so and there, are some, there are some specific things that I think came up that we'd like the applicant uh, to fasten the information down, which is of the uh, disenfranchised Verizon. Uh, subscribers in the area, what percent of the, how many there are and what percent uh, ought to be remedied substantially or significantly by the tower. Uh, and uh, the terms of the lease, I think are well, highly relevant and significant as well. Obviously if there's confidential trade sensitive information, an adjustment for that can be made is the, is the lease unconditional, by the way, or is it conditioned in part on uh, the outcome of this proceeding? Uh, I'll have to review the lease and, and get back to. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how the lease is germane to, to the zoning application, though, because whether or not there's terms in that lease that speak one way or the another, that's an agreement between two private parties. I think the only relevant information for this board is whether or not uh, Homeland Towers has the authority to bring this application. Um, so if there's specific things that the board wants, uh, maybe it could, could help illuminate those for me. Well, uh, I'll, I'll throw this out uh, for you. Uh, I have a concern that uh, if this is approved and it goes forward, uh, it has the potential be of becoming the so-called uh, Frankenstein monster where uh, the board loses an ability to exercise reasonable control and Bonnie Breyer is surrendered in, in, in exchange for an income stream, the ability to exercise any reasonable control. I'm far more confident on behalf of the community that Bonnie Breyer uh, would have a sympathetic ear to concerns that the tower may generate for the community than uh, any of the applicants or co-locators, so to speak. And, and I should say, lest you think I'm anti this, I'm a Verizon subscriber and there is almost nothing that I would like more than to be able to use my cell phone in my home, in my backyard, on my street or anywhere else nearby. Uh, I won't bore you with the story, but when power goes out and I call or something happens and I call Verizon, they say, oh, well, that's not a problem. You can always use your cell phone. And I explained that even with a, uh, a booster, 
when the power goes out, the booster goes out. And even when the power is there, the booster doesn't work so well. So as far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of compromises uh, that uh, can be accepted if it improves service considerably. But if, you know, it's gonna, not going to benefit a large number of the, uh, not the right phrase, but it comes to mind, disenfranchised cell phone subscribers, uh, that's another thing. It's a balancing test, obviously. I well, I absolutely can get you the additional information on the radio frequency justification report. And that's the goal here is we were tr trying to provide, I think, a known need in the community, which is there's a gap in services in the area. Okay. I think that also ties into the question of location. In other words, would more subscribers uh, get more service if the tower were, were on the body by our prior property, but not where it's supposed to be located now? And and some, you know, if 150, 120 or 125 uh, feet in the air, uh, if it became 140 and 20% more uh, coverage would be established, that might be a reasonable compromise. Absolutely. We can absolutely look into increasing the height of the tower. I mean, w whether it's a tree or it's a tower, if it's a tree, it's a redwood in a forest of, you know, evergreen bushes. So it's going to stand out whether it looks like a tree or it looks like a tower, it's going to be prominent where it can be seen. I think that really it is more important to the community to have more service than to have a so, somewhat shorter tower. Uh, we're taking this responses from the board and we'll absolutely look into if there's any potential to increase the size of the tower. Not all of us feel that way. Agreed. Well, agree. Agree. In increase the coverage area. I think. It's I I like to see my options. They could do the um, increase in the tower. Let me see the option. Well, I think that's what we're asking for. But you know, I think what would change if the tower were somewhere else. If the tower were a different height, from the point of view of the improved coverage. I mean, Wait, Ralph, I just to clarify. Ralph, just to clarify. I think what you're saying is that. You'd like to see, you know, an option where the tower is taller, but it's it's located closer to the middle of the course, further from the streets. Got it. If especially if that improves the coverage area. Well, we'll look into that. Uh, we, we've looked into alternative locations already, and we don't believe that we can provide a better location than what we're providing. But we'll provide additional information for the board. And likewise, as Liz pointed out, I, there were many points that were raised in this meeting. I hope you were taking notes. I know you were not, but hopefully someone was. One of her points was the uh, water tower combination with another site would that increase coverage if you had two sites rather than a larger one site? Yeah, we, we can speak to that in our response for the radio frequency justification. I did, I did make a note of that, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz, would you be able to provide them with the contact information uh, for how to reach whoever is in charge of the tower? Water tower I'm talking about. Because if they, if they tried to, you know, if they tried to do this through the golf club and got no response, that may well be because the golf club doesn't control the tower. There was also a review done from a radio frequency standpoint, but I believe the question was, would, would an additional tower or additional location on, on the uh, wing and foot uh, water tower and this facility, would that, would that be something uh, that would provide additional coverage? And we Agreed. can provide yeah, response to that. That's what we're talking about, more than one location. And hopefully to solve what really is an area-wide blackout area for cell phones. I agree. I think, though, that whether or not an additional facility or an additional site is needed, it, it does in no way alleviate the need for this facility. I think, if anything, you guys are just realizing that the gap in coverage is significant. I don't think there's any doubt of what you, as to what you just said, including from the various letters we got from people. Um, if there's no more questions from the board, um, we did note that we submitted a coastal uh, 
a coastal management zone application form. And I did hear earlier that um, there is a meeting on August 18th. Um, is that something that the board would refer us to at this time? Uh, is CZMC ready for this? I, I don't know if they're ready for CZMC. Why, why wouldn't we wait until we have the analysis from our consultant so that we have all the information? I think if yeah, we proceed with the consultant and ask the consultant to move this along, you know, get us a quote on doing this on a rapid uh, speed. Understood. Is, 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 there, is the consultant also going to be consulting the, the CZMZ, the Coastal Management Zone Board? I would think the information that the uh, consultant generates would be available to... Right. They'd share the report. Yeah, I'd say that um, Liz can probably speak to this, but I think that the CZMC would probably be most concerned with aspects of the landscaping plan and obviously any additional stormwater matters and erosion control details um, as we typically look at those items. Yeah, definitely, definitely visual, anything, you know, visual they would be interested in. But in that case, this is going to you would be premature because there isn't even a landscaping screening or any other similar plan. Plus, if some of the things we've been talking about were to come to pass, those might all change. If the tower were somewhere else, it would be different. If the tower were a different height, it may or may not be different. Uh, certainly the location would change the landscaping. Uh, so maybe this is all, this is sort of a chicken and egg thing. How do you get this thing moving uh, and not waste everybody's time or money? And I, I think the RF thing can be done, but at the RF people else all capable of comparing locations or are they purely uh, looking at the stuff which is pretty much federally preempted anyway? Uh, yes, we can compare different locations. Okay, I think that's the thing to do. And then when we have that report, and we discuss it potentially next month, I guess, uh, then we can get to a question of, you know, landscape or so on, or when you get it, if something, if you guys see it and say, hey, you know, this is not a bad idea, uh, let's make a proposal based on that. Who knows? We don't know what they're going to say. So the only decision made by planning at this point is to hire an art consultant, uh, by Rob to take the lead on this and coordinate with who, with whom, uh, with Kenny, with you, with whom? Uh, Rob can coordinate with me and, and then I'll uh, disseminate it amongst the appropriate experts. Okay, and, and Lisa and you will work out scheduling types of uh, stuff so that once we get everything we need, we can move this very quickly. Obviously, we are gonna to have to have a public hearing. I will say, by the way, having thought about that, that it probably would make sense to have this public hearing as separate from all the others as a separate meeting, which we've done on occasion, uh, which number one, potentially makes it, uh, may make it go faster. And number two, makes it not run until a quarter to 12 like it is now. Would that be, when you say a separate meeting, would that be a special meeting? Special meeting on one topic meeting, just this. Um, just as a, as a request, uh, so the property is located within 500 feet of the borders of the village of Scarsdale, um, the city of New Rochelle. Um, is the uh, board also gonna take care of the required GML referrals? and uh, the referral under the Westchester County Administrative Code to the Westchester County Planning Board, as well as the two municipalities. And seeing is that something that you take care of? It would also be the, very, the emergency services of all three communities. I would, I would say, uh, send to New Rochelle, Scarsdale, and Westchester County Planning Board. Correct. Is there anything else that anybody can propose to keep the thing moving uh, at a reasonably rapid pace? And I guess we can, in this part, there is a small thing, uh, thing yet to be discussed, 
by the planning board, but that doesn't involve any of you guys. Rob, you have given a copy, or we'll send a copy of Anthony's memo to them. Yeah, so it was done a few minutes ago. Um, David, you should have received that, so hopefully it's uh, in your email. All right, I'll check my email as soon as I log off. Um, and we would also ask that um, if there are any additional comments from any other re reviewing staff, including the wireless consultant, if and when retained, um, that we get those comments as fast as possible so we can uh, adequately address them. What's the best location to send comments to? Because I left a phone message at the 203 number a couple days ago about Coastal Zone and just never got a response. So I don't know if I was somebody I was supposed to be talking to. So I'll be the best point of contact for the, for the applicant. Um, my name is David Kenny. My uh, office phone number is 914-333-0700. Um, and my email is dkenny, D-K-E-N-N-Y, at snyderlaw.net, and that's S-N-Y-D-E-R-L-A-W dot N-E-T. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you all. And I'm asking the members and staff of the, of the planning board itself to stay on for a few minutes. Thank you for your time, board. Thank you. Take care. Okay, I think we're done. I think we're down to just us, which is fine. Uh, just to report on the accurate situation. The Zoning Board of Appeals approved their request for their various signs, which means that we now can proceed uh, with their site plan renewal. And uh, I would propose that even though we don't have a formal request for it, to keep the thing going because they delayed this forever, uh, we set a public hearing for Acura for September uh, on their site plan renew renewal. Is this some um, special permit renewal and site oh, plan we, Yeah, yes, I, think, both. I think it's I'm both. I'm sorry, yes, it's both. I was going to share with the board that I do believe I received an email today from Mr. Uh, Bolani um, stating that they wish to be placed on the September planning board agenda. I'm just reading the email as we speak right now. So um, I will be responding to him with the applicable cutoff dates for some middles. Okay, so they would be listed for both the site plan amendment and the special use permit renewal, correct? Yes, uh, that would be the intent, the expectation. Okay, is the board interested in setting such a uh, public hearing or dual public hearing for next month? I don't have an objection. Anybody have an objection? Can we have a motion to set a public hearing then? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? That's done. Time for everybody to uh, quote, go home. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Can I all? That was pretty Herculean. <laughs> yes, it was. That's why the pace is so good, Sabrina. Take care. Hey, everyone.